Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 323rd edition of the Boxing Asylum Nutters podcast. I'm your host, Steve Wellings, and joining me on the call so far this evening, we have Andy Patterson and Adam Smido Smith. Delighted to have both the boys with me back again after last week's little absence. Thank you very much to uh, Dave the Hater Lowback for taking over. It was Dave the Hater Lowback. I had a few people tweeting me. I say a few. I had two people during the week who both said, uh, sorry that you weren't there. Looking forward to having you back next week. Donnie did a great job. Well, it, was, it, was, it wasn't Donnie on last week. It was Dave the Hater Lowback. He did do a good job, and hopefully... He'll come back on and join us again tonight. He might, he might not. We've got lots of action to get on with, though. A couple of guests as well. All the stuff from next week. World Boxing Super Series in UA. Andy, have you got flaccid yet? We're not going to start with that, but are you? have you calmed down after last night, after after the great man himself? Hey, mate, when I came home last night, I watched the fight twice. Went for a wank, and then I managed to stay up for the rest of the fights and that as well. And I went to my bed, got up this morning and again, watched him again. Went for another wank, and uh, it's been all good ever since. Eh? Excellent. Always the stall. Wet Andy there. We'll be coming to Inua later. Also, Josh Taylor against Ivan Baranchik. I really enjoyed that fight. I thought it was excellent. And uh, I almost forgot Billy Joe Saunders as well. Look like they're having a great time there over in Stevenage. Sorry I wasn't there. Andy, let's go stateside, shall we? Barclays Centre, Brooklyn, New York. The man, he said he wanted a body on his record before. No matter where you stand on those comments, didn't really bother me too much. It's boxing after all. We know what these guys are like. Dominic Brazil, he's a slow starter. But he's not too slow getting down to the canvas. Deontay Wilder <laughs> smashed him up in a single round. Smashed him is the is the is the right word, mate. I mean, uh, you know, I'll address the comments where he said about you know want a body in his record. I thought his response was quite fitting. You know, he's the one in the ring. He gets to take the risks. He gets to say what he wants. Then the day I can't argue with that either. So uh, you know, fair play to him. And you know, Mauricio Suleiman's uh, reaction actually to the knockout was, you know, he's like, ah, just shook his head, that's it, over and done, mate. It was, I don't know what we can say really. I mean, Briswell well, apparently was going to, you know, it said in the past that he'd, he was a slow starter, but um, you know, he tried to kind of come out quick, I suppose, but you know, Wilder stick behind the jab. You know, good job to start off with and stuff. And uh, you know, he really kind of caught fire. And, it was just it was just a hell of a right hand. I mean, Christ, the way he went down, he just you really didn't think the guy was dead. You know, just the way he just hit the canvas, sprawled out legs out in front of him and stuff. You know, it was just it was just emphatic. You know, I was winding people up last night says we can see why Josh was ducking the fight. To be honest, I think um, I, I really think I, I don't know if I want to say this, but I, I think a Fury if shot had landed in Fury or Joshua last night, there's a good chance none of them would have got up. I really do believe that. It was just. One of those concussive shots that you just you know changes everything. You know, I, I don't I don't suspect we'll see Brazil being the same fighter again, even off the back end of that. But uh, you know, as for Wilder, great finish, and uh, thankfully I did it early because I was kind of lagging at four o'clock in the morning, half past four. So I'm glad I did it uh, pretty soon. I'm sure you were, Andy. Thanks for cutting yourself short there. We're delighted to have our first guest of the evening on the call. It's Leon Woodstock. How are you, Leon? Yo, what's good? I'm alright. How are you? Not too bad. We're just talking about the action last night, actually. A bit of Deontay Wilder against Dominic Brazil. Did you get to see it at oh, all? Yeah. No, nah, I don't really watch boxing. I've seen, like, clips of it, though, after. OK, cool. No problem. Well, let's talk about your career, then, shall we, instead? Because you're boxing yeah, yeah. domestic rival Zelfa Barrett on June the 15th yeah. in Leeds. You must be buzzing for this fight. Yeah, I'm, I, I love seeing in big fights. I'm never really in a boring fight, to be fair. Last, the last two years of my career, I've been nominated... Uh, for the fight of the year, so I'm guessing I'll be in it again <laughs> in this fight. So I'm never in a boring fight, so I'm looking forward to it. I like to be in proper uh, challenges, not fighting these journeymen or just building my record up and whatnot. Like, I do things properly. Fair enough. Um, Zelfa Barrett himself, he stuck your face on a punch bag to try and get himself into the zone. Have you done anything similar yeah. for him? Nah, I don't need to do anything like that to get myself in the zone. Like, when I chose to be a professional, I knew what I was getting myself into and I was motivated from there. I don't really lack motivation or need to do anything like that to motivate myself. Uh, when you first made the fight announcement on Twitter, I saw a comment below. Somebody said, great fight for both of you, all about who does the weight better, as I think both of you are real lightweights. What would you respond to that, okay. Leon? Um, my honest opinion is that is throw me in any weight division and I'll do what I do, do you know what I mean? Like, to me, weight's never really been a big deal to me because my coach is always throwing me in with a lot heavier guys and, you know, from young, do you know what I'm saying? So, I'm, 
I don't know, weight's not really a big issue. I make super featherweight quite comfortably, to be honest, so it's, it means nothing to me. You mentioned being in exciting fights. You're 12-1. and one. The one loss came against yeah. Archie Sharp in your hometown. It was an excellent fight, yeah. but how do you look back on that defeat now? Say again, please. How do you look back on that defeat now? Are you philosophical? How do you how do you see it? Oh, that, that, that is like the single, one of the, be, the best single things that, that's ever happened to in my life, like outside of boxing as well. Like that, that's how I look at it. It's the best thing that's happened to me from like what I've gained from it. You can't buy what I've gained from it. You can't get it from nowhere apart from going through it. So it's quite a unique experience. Especially if you, um, especially how you perceive it. That's mm. what I'd say. How you perceive um, going through stuff like that will determine whether it's a unique experience for you or not. But for me, it was um, a very highlighting experience. Okay, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, just to remind our listeners, we have uh, Leon Woodstock on the call. We've got Leon for another couple of minutes or so at Young Simba over on Twitter. Any other social media presences? Um, just Leon Woodstock Jr. on my uh, Instagram. That's what I'm mostly active on Twitter and Insta, really. So, yeah, you got it there. Um, you're obviously no stranger to the first direct arena because you beat Craig Poxton yeah. there in 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're going to be looking to do the same sort of job on Zelfa Barrett. Again, that was another good fight. Um, I'm forever growing. My style's forever changing and growing and um, becoming better. Do you know what I mean? Because my main goal in life, bar boxing, bar anything, is just to become the best version of Leon Woodstock I can. And I asked to be, I asked for that a very long time ago. I asked the universe for that a long time ago. So, everything that's happening now, whether it be wins, losses, draws, or minor setbacks in my life, in and out of the ring, that's all going towards making me the best version of myself. So I can't really moan or complain because I asked for this a very long time ago. You're fighting on the undercard of Josh Warrington's uh, world title defence against Kid Galahad. They're both confident guys, both unbeaten. Who, in your opinion, wins the main event? Um, I think it's going to be quite um, a good fight, to be honest. Uh, Warrington, um, I respect when he fought Shelby. Because um, I've always been a really big Selby fan, even though I'm not really big on boxing. When I do watch it, he's probably one of my go-tos. Uh, him and Crawford as well. I do like watching a bit of Crawford. But, um, so I didn't expect it to go the way it did. So, um, sorry, not Samson. Warrington really showed me a lot for that fight. So, I reckon, And again, against Samson as well. So I feel like he'll take it as well, to, um, this one against Galahad. But I don't think it'll be straightforward because... And I had, um, I've sparred him quite a few times. I think I've sparred him like seven, eight times. Um, he's quite a good operator, but again, Warrington's very relentless. And when you've got that type of energy and pressure coming on you, it's, it's hard to deal with, no matter how good your boxing is. So just picking up, just picking up um, on something you mentioned briefly whenever we first started talking, I take it you don't lo watch a lot of boxing generally? No, not really. I, I watch a lot of the old fights. I'll always, I've always got time for that, but I don't really watch a lot of um, modern day boxing unless you've got something special about you OK at Young Simba on Twitter everybody we're going to ring Zelfa Barrett shortly for a chat as well so have you got any messages that you wanted to pass on to him see you June the 15th well done sir that'll do nicely best of luck to you Leon and thanks for joining us on no this worries. Sunday evening no worries thank you cheers all the best now Leon Woodstock there, doesn't watch a lot of boxing. No use to us, Smid. You're the main man for the boxing watching these days. You were watching Deontay Wilder against Dominic Brazil last night. Did you stay up, Smid? No, no, didn't stay up. But um, I got up this morning, watched it straight away, didn't know the result. Um, yeah, I said after, I mean, I know it was obvious, but I said to the missus after about 30 seconds, this ain't going to last long. And we, But we already kind of knew that before. And um, I tuned in wanting Deontay Wilder to get beat. Um, I've been doing that for a few years, really. Um he got rocked up by Eric Molina about three years ago, um, and um, yeah, I just I just want him to get beat. But um, he is extremely entertaining, isn't he? I mean, he's we know that he's wildwood by name, wildwood by nature, um, and it, that his power is just. I know it's been spoke about the left, right, and centre since at the early hours of this morning, but just ridiculous. Absolutely folded him, and as M Matthew Macklin said, Dominic Brazil is was um, starfished. I think was the the term he used. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the the most intriguing thing about the 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 free the free top kid is at heavyweight is that we um every time you watch one of them fight or the pair of them fight like Fury and Wilder did, you I often get, a, get have a different opinion after watching one of them how it would pan out if if he faced Joshua, if he faced Fury, if he faced Wilder kind of thing, and that's what that's what's good about it, you know, is it Fury's boxing or Wilder's power or you know Joshua's athleticism, you know, it's um. It's a good trade-off, and and hopefully we get to find out the answers. But as for the fight, I mean, I thought Wilder again was was um was rocked in that um when he when he first hurt Brazil and then tried to follow up. I think that was in the first round. Um, yeah, it was. Um, it was all in the first round, oh, Smith. All in the first round. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, in the first minute or so. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. He, yeah. Wilder. Wilder uh, knocked him with that right hand, kind of chased him across the ring a little bit. Again, very wild in his follow up. Um. And then yeah, Brazil clocked him, and he. But I don't. He, he didn't panic Wilder at that point. I think previously we we might have seen him panic, but he's getting you know obviously he's gaining experience as he goes along, and I think that um you know it he did obviously take a back step, but I think the back step was 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 um, you know fifty fifty out of choice, and you know fifty fifty for being hurt. So um I think he did all right there, and then I mean that punch that's finished it. I mean he's absolutely detonated Annie, and you know he is exciting. He's got the attitude, and 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 after the fight, I think. You know, it's easy to get to buy into people when they start talking rather than doing. But he did, to me, genuinely sound like they, they wanted to make the fights. But on the Monday morning, when they sit down and they say, I've got a box on this TV channel and you've got a box on that TV channel, then that's where we know it falls apart. But it's got to happen, hasn't it? It really, really has. Either the Fury rematch or the, or the Joshua fight or both. Simply got Smido, El- Elliot Saunders in the chat is talking your language. He said that 18 to 1 Wilder was for the first round KO. Yep, yep, so- sounds about right. And and if anyone was on it, fair play. Um, I've basically packed up gambling on boxing. I've I've, I've been been losing, so um, yeah, I've cut I've cut it off really. But yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Um, a, a few people were you know bigging up the KO within the first four round, four or five rounds. I saw that on on, on a few tweets on you know Saturday. So yeah, fair play if you got on. Fair play if you got on. Let's get on to you, Andy. Back to Wilder again. We spoke about it briefly at the top of the show, about these comments. People were disappointed by what he said. But me personally, as I said before, we revere Mike Tyson now. And look at the litany of crimes he's come off with over the years, you know, trying to uh, bite Lennox Lewis, trying to break Franz Botha's arm, saying that he wanted to push Bruce Seldon's nose bone into his, his skull. It depends what you want to be upset by. I mean, Tyson Fury came off with these mad comments about, like, sort of gays and Jews and all this type of stuff. Anthony Joshua was trying to start a sort of uh, superior race cult with Eddie Chambers. I mean, where, where, do, where does it end, Andy? Well, we had David Hay pre- promoting gang rape as well at one point. Um, was it you know, for the Harrison fight or something? Um, mm. You know, some people obviously got up in arms about that. You know, my most favourite fighter of all time, Robert uh, Roberto Duran, uh, once said he wanted to, you know, if he didn't put a guy in the morgue, then the knockout didn't count. So, um, yeah, you know, Ali says some disgusting shit for time to time. You know, he would fucking racism and stuff like that. Okay, he had his his own problems. You know been targeted for racism and stuff like that, but I don't know what people really want. I mean, here's WBC now talking about bringing in some sort of code of ethics and stuff like that. I mean, sorry, the WBC of all the organisations to come out to decide to give us, you know, some sort of kind of, you know, fucking guidance on how to behave at Wayne's and stuff like that. Fucking behave yourself. You know, corrupt bastards get involved in all that sort of stuff. You know, in the day, you've got two guys at a weigh-in who are basically kind of like, you know, they're uptight, you know, they're basically going to in a mindset, they know they're going to into harm's way, they're going into a fight, so obviously they're going to be fucking keyed up. What do you want? You know, do you want these guys to fucking shake hands and stuff like that, and then then, then, then we can walk away and stuff like that? Okay, I happened like that in the old days and stuff like that, but there's still some shit getting spoken about in the in the background and that as well. I, I really don't know what people really want, or people you know really want to say. In my opinion, Will doesn't want taking the risks. At the end of the day, if you take the risk, I think you can say what you want. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Oh, I didn't mind it at all, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, to say you want a body on your record, I mean, I don't know. We've had, I, I mean, Andy's given some examples. We've had Bellew weighing in on Twitter, even though he said he was willing to die in the ring. I mean, what, there's not much, very much difference there. Um, you know, it's it. it what's worse, uh, for example, Hay and Trezora brawling in a in in Germany. Uh, bottling each other or something that comes out Deontay Wilder's mouth. What's worse for the sport? I don't know. And with Andy, he can say what he wants. I don't care. 
Yeah, people come off with odd stuff. I remember a heavyweight uh, back in the day in Belfast going on about, I hope we all come home safely. And then the next thing he was saying, he was going to put his opponent in a casket. It's just all bullshit talk at the end of the day, isn't it? Sounds like the Undertaker and Kane. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. They just come off with odd stuff and spur of the moment and boxing's full of contradictions. You know, he's a cheat, they're a cheat while they're arm in arm with cheats. I mean, it's the race to the the bottom of what about her, Andy? Well... As I say, you know, boxing is one of the most, you know, it's needing a sport, man. It's a business. It's one of the most corrupt ones in that as well. They're always vested interests. They're always, you know, it's, it's one of these sports in the background of that where anybody can walk in. Anybody from any type of background, any type of education can walk into boxing and somehow make a living out of it. It's important. It's crazy, man. It's a fucking well west. It is indeed the Wild West. Shout out to the Wild West of the podcast. That's the chat room. Everybody's in there. A few new faces as well. Hamid's there. Elliot Saunders. Good to see you. Fox B. Sleep 99 says Wembley, Saunders, Wilder, Eurovision. Farcical weekend, really. <laughs> it was a quite a farcical weekend. Hamid says don't get too excited about Joshua's uh, Wilder's win, rather, against Brazil. It was, after all, only Brazil. Quick word, Smido, on the Sky Studio. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. And how, how many rounds did take Joshua got to him? It was about seven or eight, wasn't it, I think? Enough said. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Smido, what about the Sky Studio? I'm assuming you watched this on the Sky Studio. George Grove seemed like he was enjoying his post-retirement party. I think he's been on a non-stop bender since he retired. And <laughs> Dillian White could barely string a sentence together. This was after the World Boxing Super Series. Did it get any better in the early hours of the, of the morning? I didn't watch a single second of what the studio had to say during the early hours for the Wilder broadcast. But I must say, I mean, I mean that I'm getting flashbacks of last time I came on. I was overly positive about the commentary team, um, but um, I thought White and, and Groves were, were okay because, given that the basis, the the baseline, if you want, is Carl Frotch that does not watch any, that wouldn't have really known anything about Inoue, Rodriguez, um, Taylor, or um, Badakic or whatever his fucking name was. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised when um, when the when the lady asked um, Chisora and Grove specific questions about the upcoming fights for the WBSS. They both had a little bit of insight, um, and to a casual like me who's not watched Rodriguez or uh, Badovic or whatever his name is, I, was, I thought I thought it was quite useful. I mean, it might have been it might have been a load of shite, but at least I believed that they'd looked looked into it. Unlike when Frotch opens his mouth, but no, I didn't see it in the early hours. What did Dillian White say? Bring bring him on or something like that. Steve? Steve on? Well, Matt, welcome to the Boxing Asylum. You're listening to Adam Smith on his own. Sorry about that, Smido. I was just busy <laughs> ringing our second guest of the evening. I'm delighted to welcome Zelfa Barrett. How are you, Zelfa? Hello, hello. I'm good, I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us. We are discussing good, good. Deontay Wilder at the moment. He's KO of Dominic Brazil. Did you manage to see it at all? Yeah, man, I watched it... Um... Knock up, scary, <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty good fighter, isn't he? A lot of people are impressed, but they're now saying, Zelfa, it's time to stop the nonsense, get Wilder, get AJ, get Fury in with one another. Yeah, um, you know, we've already seen a good fight with Fury and uh, Wilder, so time to um, ever get that on, get that again, or, you know, AJ, AJ, AJ Wilder. Well, just before we move on to your career, sticking on the heavyweight theme, we saw Wilder last night. Who do you think is the best of the three? Who is going to come out on top? Um, Fiori, I think, is, is, I think he's better than all of them. He's got a good boxing ability, um, yeah. good ring craft. is very good to Fiori, so I, I'd say Fiori. Do you but agree? Do you agree with I, the majority? Do you agree I, with I, the majority of our panel? In his video, yeah, I think it was today. Yeah. But um, what's he called? Wilder can knock people out. <laughs> Don't stand in front of him. He'll knock you out. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say to you was, do you agree with us that we thought, the majority of the panel thought, that Fury won that first Wilder fight? Yeah, I thought he did. Man. He won it just because he got knocked down. Doesn't mean he won a fight. You know what I mean? Should have been there, what is it, in, in a 10, 10, 10, 8 round. But even then, when he got knocked down, he even come back and fought. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Fury didn't come out on top of all of them. You have a big fight coming up as well on June the 15th against fellow prospect Leon Woodstock. We've actually just spoken to Leon, but how are you preparing yeah. for the fight? How are we preparing? Yeah. Um, just like normal, just getting some good sparring, 
good track work, you know, preparing for 12 hard rounds. And there's going to be a title on the line as well. James Tennyson vacated the Commonwealth Super Featherweight title, so that will be on the line. So that's an added incentive. Um, it is, but you know, winning's an added incentive in general. You know, without winning, you can't win the title. So, to me, it's just about getting a win. And the bonus it, is the title. Yeah. In early 2018, you lost a majority decision to Ronnie Clark. What did you learn from that loss, Zelfa? Um, I learned that I'm naturally fit because you know I took the fight on a short notice. So I've learned. I learned that I'm naturally fit, and I've learned that I've got heart and a good chin. You know, you, you know that as a fighter, like you say you've got it, but when it when it really happens, you have you really got it, and I know I have. Mm. And after a loss, some fighters. They go soul searching. They ch change trainers. They question their whole regime. Did you do any of that? No, nah, because it was nothing for me to question. You know, like I said, I'm a real fighter. A fight got put at me. I shot notice in the pocket. You know, twelve rounds. I never did a twelve round in my, in my life. But then, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, it's nothing to question. You know, it's just all. It was all. Uh, it was all games for me because I've answered questions for myself. Yeah, and you'll be all the better for the experience, you think? Of course, like, you can't buy experience and, you know, like I said, yeah, I, I would be questioning myself and prepared for, like, eight weeks or 12 weeks and I got beat. But, you know, we're even that kind of situation, so it's all up for me. Hmm. Uh, just to remind our listeners, we have Zelfa Barrett on the call at Zelfa Flash on Twitter and Instagram. What kind of uh, content do you put up on your social media platform, Zelfa? Um, it's just more time boxing all with my mum. And uh, just a final couple of questions, and we do thank you for joining us on this Sunday yeah. evening. Um, what about the Warrington versus Galahad fight, which is on your card as well? Who do you see winning that one? That's a very, very, very good fight. You know, um, I'm on the fence with that because they're both very good fighters. Um, Kip Galahad is very, very talented, very, very skillful, very intelligent in the ring. He's like you. The boxing is very good. And, you know, so Josh Warren, his he, he boxing IQ is very high, you know. He, his style doesn't justify how intelligent he's in the ring. And he's relentless too, so it's a, it's a very good fight. I'm on the fence, I'm on the fence. You're on the fence. Are you anticipating a distance fight, do you think? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, if Josh Warren gets his game plan right, then it could, it, it could be even if... Because Kalad gets the game from the game from right, his own game from playing it, and it could be his too. But you know, um, they're both great fighters. Josh Warren's a great fighter. Kikar's a great fighter. So you know, it could be twelve rounds of war, twelve rounds of, of boxing. You know, it's just it's the best man will win that night. And just the final question for you: Your uncle Pat was a good fighter back in the day. Tell us about the boxing yep. relationship between you two guys. It's great, man. He's like my dad, so. You know, I couldn't ask for a better trainer because he's been in the ring himself, he's fought, he knows boxing in and out. Um, I couldn't ask for a better person to ask advice for, to give me advice. So, you know, the race is great. And as well, as something that just came to my mind as well. Can you explain to the listeners about your break from the ring? Because you fought Edwin Tellez and then it was a long time again when you fought him for the second time. Yeah, um, I, got, I injured my leg, I, got, I injured my Achilles. I think that operated on and um, take time out of the ring, take time out of training. Yeah. That's the reason why I didn't, I didn't fight for ages because I got injured and um, I think it was like the end of August. Feeling good now, feeling strong? Yeah, I'm feeling good, feeling strong. As, as you could see now, I come back and stop telling in a few rounds. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm back, man. You're back indeed. Finally, Zelfa, give yeah. us a prediction for your fight against Leon Woodstock on June the 15th. Um, a Zelfa Barrett victory. Zelfa Barrett victory, good um, one. Sitting on the fence again. Boxing. <laughs> you know, um, Liam's a good fighter, but, you know, I believe I'm, believe I'm better than him. You know, I'm going gonna, gonna to put on a show on June 15th and it's going to be the new, and the new Commonwealth champ champion, Zelfa Barrett. Good stuff. We're looking forward to it. At Zelfa Flash, everybody, over on social media. Best of luck, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Zelfa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
So for Barrett there, everybody, um, yeah, sorry about me talking over him. There seemed to be a slight lag on the line or something, so I was hearing him just a couple of seconds later. But there you go, that's that's the way it is, you know. No lag with you, Smido. You're on point tonight. You're refreshed after a, a little break. Fatherly duties now. Are you are you pumped up for the boxing again? Depends. If the, if there's good fights on, Steve, I'll watch it. If it's shit fights, I ain't watching. Well said, exactly. What about the Deontay Wilder undercard? Did you catch any of that? I must confess, Smid, I didn't see the Gary Russell Kiko Martinez fight yet. But this this young Martinez, he looks like he could have a future in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get him over to England. It could be it could be a good test for some of our for some of our guys over here. Um, no, well, as everyone, we've not seen enough or anything of of Gary Russell Jr. Um, he's thirty years old now, but. Um, you know, he's obviously a very, very talented boxer when when he's in the ring. Um, and hopefully you can now we see him in the ring more often now he's got this this fight in the bag. Um, he just peppered Martinez. Um, I did actually watch it, Steve, for a change. I watched an undercard fight. Um, just the speed. You know, we know what Martinez, uh, Martinez is. But yeah, just the speed that, that done him. Um, picked, picked him off all night long, basically, um, until we forced a stoppage with some some a pretty uh, significant eye damage. I think the stoppage was a bit of a combination between the um, a willing doctor and also a willing ref. I think that if um, if they if if all parties wanted to, that could have you know had got gone on and had a further inspection before calling it off. But um, obviously, at, even at that early-ish stage of the fight, the mid stage of the fight, he wasn't going to win the fight. Um, I think the boxer was okay with it being called off. The ref was okay with it being called off, and so was the doctor. So it kind of added up to uh, to the stoppage that we got. But I mean, um, it, did, I was a bit confused, Steve. Um, is is Russell Junior a, a champion currently, or did they say former WBC champion? I didn't quite catch that on the call. Oh, he's still he's still the WBC champ, isn't he? As far as I know, yeah, he is. He's still WBC but, champ, mate. But I didn't see the belt at all um, on the ring walk or while he was, they were being introduced. Um, but I fast forward through the actual audio of the introduction. Um, I did very much enjoy his um, his entrance, Steve. Very much so. Um, he entered, mm. he entered the ring with some sort of um, traditional African. Um, tribe um, outfit with shield included um, and he entered the ring with said shield which took some doing so fair play to him through the ropes with a shield and his gloves and his body brilliant liking the sound of that liking the sound of a bit of Rob Kelly as well in a minute we'll come to him shortly Matthew Dolan in the YouTube chat shout out to you Matthew why does Steve remind me of Adam Smith stroke Mr Bean he says I don't know Matthew why do you remind me of um, I don't know actually come on the call and let's hear what you remind me of sir I'll throw you the link if you want all these chat boxes, Andy, these chat bots even are getting stuck in there. Uh, Rob, timestamp, any timestamp updates? Big talk from a from a critic leads Wellings to invite a uh, chat member on pod. Got it, got it, Steve. Don't worry. There you go. At 29 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> exactly. Rob, we'll be back to you shortly on, on Wild. I just want to get Andy's um, opinion, first of all, and Gary Russell. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, Andy. Is it worth watching? No, I think uh, the, to be honest, I think the cut basically saved uh, Martinez to fight another day. It was just everything, you know, the hand speed. He was well on, obviously coming forward, but the, you know, the hand speed was getting overwhelmed and stuff. And I think you know it was just going to go one way. And he was just going to take a heavy beating as the fight wore on, and I think it would have been a mercy stoppage at some point. So I think the cut probably at the right time. And you know, as Smithel says, the doc and the ref were probably kind of like saying, "Listen, it was overmatched here at this point." You know, it's. It is what it is. You know, Martinez was 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 good was good copy, good good uh, good uh, good value. Sorry, um, four year ago, he's just, he's just you know a well known opponent now. That's all he is. So um, it sounds like Russell's kind of really pushing for a Santa Cruz fight. That I don't really want to see, but I'm I'm not interested if it's going to take another year to make that fight. I want to see Russell fight at least twice this year. Oh. So. Uh, Andy Flip, eh? That's like uh, uh, Archie Aye. Moore. Archie Moore for him. <laughs> <laughs> Sugar Ray Robinson. <laughs> uh, aye. No, but, but uh, just, I just want to see him, you know, fight like, a, a top name, you know. So, aye. You know, plus, he's been meandering along ever since that Lomachenko defeat. So, um, I just want to see him tested. Um, and a unification fight as well. So, uh, aye, get that made. I want to see that fight. As I say, I don't want to see, uh, wait another year for it. We need to get that fight made soon. Absolutely right, Andy. We want to see uh, Gary Russell Jr. fighting instead of sitting on the sidelines, fighting the likes of Leo Santa Cruz, which would be an excellent fight. If you've only just joined the call, like rapping Rob Kelly, you're listening to episode 323 of the Nutters podcast. 
shout out to all our friends in the chat. We haven't got round to Taylor in UA just yet, but we will be soon, Rob. I want to get your opinion on Wilder against Brazil first. Like yeah. I said at the top of the show, Brazil, he's so slow. And he, I think he was trying to guard the body. And Wilder just came upstairs with an absolute, he set his feet and he threw this big wing in right hand and just bang right on the chin. Right on the chin. Uh, no, look, Brazil is trash, right? But, like, he really is. He's bad. Like, he's, his fundamentals are bad. Like, he came to boxing late, like a lot of these heavyweights these days. Like, he's not a good heavyweight. He may have put himself in a, in a position for a mandatory after a couple of good wins. But the only other time we've seen him in the spotlight is face down at Wembley as well, right? So, but we, had, we have to put it into perspective. He's not good. But out of the three opponents that the top, supposed the top three heavyweights have, Brazil was probably the best of them. And you thought, like, that's the that's the one that has a banana skin. But really, like, if Wilder hits you, you're gone. You know, he, he if really, really, if he hits you, it's over. I mean, if the, the Fury, when he got up that time, it was a miracle, really. And it was that was probably a worse shot than he hit Brazil with last night because he got him with one on the way down. It was almost identical. The kind of, the way his, his hand is not even fully extended, his right hand, it just kind of detonates kind of halfway through. But I think he should change, he should come up with it. He should change his catchphrase now um, from Bomb Squad to something along the lines of float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. It could be kicks, punch with a, <laughs> punch like a kick from a mule, walk like a baby foal. Because he got, he got tagged himself. Smooth, as well. Rob, smooth. Yeah, yeah. His, his, he got tagged as well. And he's vulnerable. But it's, it's, a, it's a case of um, when, not if, Wilder Wilds uh, catches you. Because as bad as he is, he seems to be able to, to put punches together enough against anybody that he actually can touch him. And if he touches you, it's over. And actually, I don't give a fuck what people say now. They might say that this is a bias or whatever, but I would make him the favourite against AJ now. If he hits AJ with that, there's fucking no way he's getting up. No <laughs> way. No way. And AJ has shown he's not Willow to Wisp either. He is hittable against the top guys that he fights. Povetkin was finding him. Vlad found him. Dillian White, who wasn't even a top guy at the time, was able to find him. So I've no doubts that his awkwardness, his unorthodox stance would present something different for Joshua and if he fucking hits him with that the AJ trade is coming to an end <laughs> Rob, I guarantee it mate, you remember that time when um, I, uh, I made that, that comment about the old shit balls and stuff like that and it was all, it was all related to that clutch goal if he could land that shot down the pipe mm. you know, and he did land it he just, he just, for some reason he couldn't follow up on it right? but he did land just too it old. Just, just too, too old, old. But, but <laughs> there you go, man. It's just but hey, you just know. Yeah, it's who lands first in that fight. If in his Joshua can punch a bit, and Wilder looks vulnerable when he gets hit as well. His legs look all over the shop. Like even Fury in the in the twelfth <laughs> round was giving him some kind of it was wobbling a little bit. So and Fury's not the biggest puncher out of the three. But if Wilder fights, like there's a reason they turned down that fifty million. Believe it. Like <laughs> Eddie now is in a position where he has to cash AJ out because I tell you, if AJ looks bad against Andy Ruiz, if he, if this fight goes into the eighth, ninth, tenth round, and AJ don't get him out of here. Wilder's the fucking number one guy in the States. Knockouts like that, that's what gets people's attention. You know, he's been in the big fight. Fury and Wilder have gone and fought each other. It's AJ now who needs to step up to the plate and either make this Fury fight, which is not going to happen, or make the Wilder fight, which is more realistic. And I think they really need to, to piss now or get off the path, make sure, like, Wilder's making sure he's saying all the right noises. He wants to fight. Let's get it, let's get it done now and let's see what they're, what they're made of, like. Rob, shout out from Lee Frotch in the chat. He said with wordplay like that, it's no wonder Rob's rap career gone about as far as Harley Ben's boxing career. Oh dear. <laughs> now Lee, it must be now. I tell you what you do, get back in the get back in the fucking cupboard with a four pack of Stella. <laughs> <laughs> Flat on his back and the flat earth from Rob Kelly there, ready to get stuck into Leaf Watch. We'll have a bit of banter with the lads over in the chat there. Let us move on, shall we? There was something I was going to say. Can't remember what it was. Maybe we'll come back to it later. Maybe we won't. Who knows? Uh, yeah, John Swan was in Twitter there talking about David Diamante, but I believe he's now the zone exclusive. Let's move on, Andy. No more bullshit from me. Let's get on to the main event of all main events in Scotland last night. Naoa Inoue against Emmanuel Rodriguez. I thought Rodriguez might take Inoue a few rounds. Uh, yeah. Usual prediction bullshit from me. Well, I, I was kind of I was kind of wary last week of making a prediction for this fight. I had because I was expecting it to go rounds, but my fucking Christ, man! You know, as I say, I asked the. Uh, I actually asked on Twitter, you know, how do they punch you sound on the TV? Well, I watched it back, and believe me, 
they punches they punches sounded like shit on the telly compared to how it sounded in the arena. Those were fucking uranium fists he was throwing there last night. Every punch, you know, I think Rodriguez got slightly, you know, excited is probably the wrong word I'm looking for, actually. I say the, the word I was looking for. But I think he just got overconfident because he, he was landing a couple of straight right hands that kind of got... Uh, Drunk on success, Andy, maybe. Uh, maybe, yeah, because if you've seen it, he actually then got on the front foot and tried to push Inouye back. And I just think he got a wee bit kind of slight overconfident thinking, says, all right, okay, I can, I can, I can tag him, I can maybe slightly hurt him, I've got him backing up. But, uh, my God, man, when he, hit, when he drilled him with that left hook, Christ's sake, I was like, what, 60 feet for that shot? What a shot, man. You know, as I say, every shot he threw was absolutely, you know, nuclear. And um, I'm not joking. I mean, I've never seen so much intrigue for a fighter visiting this country. You know, people were up, you know, as soon as that fight started, and that, any spare space that was running a bit nearby me, that because I was near the front, people were like, you know, in there trying to kind of get a look at this guy. And the, the mere fact that it lasted two rounds, mixed with the Japanese people there, who, by the way, they were the, in there in their thousands of Japanese as well, all mixed stuff up. The place was bananas when that fight ended. Absolutely crazy. They couldn't believe it. But um, no, it's. Um, I think the. I think it was Alex. Alex, you know, uh, Alex Morris on uh, on Twitter last night. I think he said something. Was it 441 seconds he's now fought anyway in the last three fights, and he's just aced his opponents. Uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, he came out there. I was next to. Well, I was next to him, but I was standing, you know, at the ring walks as, as he came out and stuff. Cool as ice, you know, not a bit of, you know, stress on him, you know, perspiration on him. He was in there to do a job and that, and he uh, did it emphatically, enjoyed himself, and uh, it was just, it was, just, as I say, it was just, uh, you see a fighter like that coming up, and you think to yourself, right, okay, you think he's going to be special and stuff, and it's just see him live, you know, because I was kind of like tossing with the kind of idea to kind of go in and see him in Japan and stuff, but, you know, circumstances kind of change and that, and just f for this fight to kind of, like, land him a lap, so to speak, and the chance to go in and go to it, it was, uh, it was fantastic to see, actually, because I'm a big fan of the guy and stuff, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it's good to say as well, poor Denaire, actually, because he was in the ring there last night, being all lovey-dovey with him and stuff, like, giving him a cuddle and all that sort of stuff, and Danito, we all love you, mate, but, um, you know, it's going to end bad. I, I really do. You know, I want. I didn't want to see a legend go out like this, like. But uh, this is the closest thing you're going to see. And you know, a few people said it last night on Twitter. They said it live in the arena and that as well. Is this is the closest thing you're going to see a prime Pacquiao circa 07, 08, 09. You know, maybe even somewhat a kind of Valero, so to speak. We all consider the kind of terms of the punching power. But this is different level punching power. You know, I dare say we'll speak about where he's going to go in terms of weight and that in the future and that. But this guy, the intrigue, you know, he's just he's just going to cause, you know, he's just going to cause a lot of destruction in that division. And he's also going to cause a lot of copy in that as well. Um, and hopefully he travels. So I want to see him in America as, as well at some point. I think that's where the final is going to be sometime September, October. On the on the Taylor card with a uh, program that as well. So yeah, it was a uh, all night, uh, you know, good night a uh, boxing. It was a really enjoyable uh, night as well. So it was a uh, really good to see anyway live. And that I'm, I must admit, you know, big fan of the guy. So uh, I'm going to say right to the fanboy and uh, will be forever. Fanboy forever, Andy. Before you run off, there a couple of guys in the chat have thrown possible names in in answer to your question of who could possibly give Inoue any trouble. Ant said he thinks maybe Tete. Somebody else mm. disagrees. Del Boy's Boxing News said Luis Neri. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah. What, what fight? Uh, sorry, what late weight is he at? He's still at bantamweight because maybe he had the issue with the weights and stuff. Uh, I thought diuretics. he was moving up to super bantam or something. Plus, he's with the PBC now as well, isn't he? Yeah, because he had the issue with diuretics and stuff. But uh, yeah. no, I mentioned the name last night actually, and obviously it's going to have to wait. But um, it would be interesting if he does go up uh, to one twenty-two after this. But um, he does look, you know, against the air that he did look slightly small and that. So I don't know if he's at his ceiling in terms of weight. I think one twenty-two, one twenty-six is going to be an absolute, you know, mega push. That's going to have to be at the back end of his career. But one twenty-two is probably the ceiling. And if he does go up, I would love to see him call out Navarrete. I think that would be that would be an absolute ultimate test to see, you know, you know, the weird guy coming up. Navarrete, he's a big, big guy. Emmanuel was, Navarrete, who beat Dogbe. Yeah. That's see, I wasn't one. that fussed on him. I think he knew I would run through him, Andy, well, even though he's tall. Bring it on then, mate, because mm. um, you know, big dude as I say, but is he got the power? This is the thing, is things he going to go up and wait? Is that power going to carry up against the bigger guys? You know? Mm. 
He's, 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 as Alex said last night, I think it's 441 seconds in his last three fights have lasted. You know, Daner, I mean, honestly, God, I mean, Daner is going to be respected, obviously. You know, he could, he could extend it six rounds, but <sighs> you're thinking, man, you know, his age, what he's achieved, Daner I'm talking about here, mm. has he really got it in him to start taking, you know, if it does get heavy weather, to take a no. beating? No. 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 no, I can't see it. I don't see it, mate. I mean, I can see it tops. I'm going to give him. I'll give. I'll give him a lot of respect, and I'll say it's. He, he can take it six rounds. Yeah, the guys in the chat are, are going back and forwards on who they think can give him some trouble. JG in there mentioned a few names. John Doe as well. Danny Young, a regular as well, was there last night watching the action. No sign of Matthew Dolan. Ice Tim. Yep. See you later. Counted out. Uh, Richard Swig was saying asylum. I'd like to thank you all for bringing Inoue to my attention on your podcast years ago when he beat Navarez. If it weren't for you, lads, I wouldn't have known who he was because of the paucity of press coverage he gets over here. Uh, Richard Swig also went on to say, I think he starches Estrada when he moves up, but Srisaket is the one who might take him rounds, and I'm marvelling at the fact he has to move up into his fourth weight class to face a top pound-for-pound pound guy in order for him to face someone who might be able to deal with his power. Any comments on that, Andy, before we move on to Smith? It's happened quite a fair bit, actually, because you've seen like Uzik having to move up to get tests. Lomachenko, to some point, I knew he obviously. Uh, there was cries, remember, for, for Floyd to go up the middle weight at one point. Manny going up in weight. You know, there's you know people want to see Golovkin go up because they want to get you know the proper test at middle weight at points and stuff. It's incredible, you know, because you want to see these guys tested really to a point. But as a really, do you really want to see? Him, do you, you know, it, there's a thing to be said about a fighter to stay in his division and absolutely obliterate it pick up all the belts and dominate it. But there's also something special to go up and absolutely dominate as well. You know, we've seen other greats do it and that. So, you know, I, I think anyway that as well, he's well managed and stuff like that. But I think, you know, the Japanese way of, way of living, the way, way of thinking that, I think it will also be a, you know, a point of legacy here, you know, want to get laid down. Yeah, MB mentioned in the chat there about Tarot McCullough supposed to be fighting Navarrete. So that's what they're talking about, whether it'll come off or not, I don't know. Possibly on the Force Park Conlon card, but we'll look forward to that in the future if it happens. Smido, uh, tell me about the Inoue Rodriguez fight. Also moving forward, Colin Cooper wants to know from you, uh, can you predict where he will go after the World Boxing Super Series? We assume Smid is going to get rid of Don Air. Would he be able to go to 122? Is 126 a bridge too far, says Colin? Uh, yes, the short, I think the short answer to that is yes. I mean, l last night, um, you know, Rodriguez was the was the bigger guy in there, and you know, for people like me who who haven't seen him all that often, I was thinking, yeah, if he if he moves up to one twenty two, definitely one twenty six, he's going to encounter problems just because of it, the the uh, the size disadvantage he he will then have. Um, but I mean, I I tweeted last night, and there's not many people who do it for me in boxing anymore, but he's one of them. He literally gets me out of my seat. He's done that for two fights running. I've watched them both live. Um, the missus wondered what I was doing last night, but I did, it literally got me out of my seat when he landed that shot. Um, I think they traded, um, uh, what, well, anyway, traded quite a bit more in the first round than I was expecting. They was both uh, wing, winging in left hooks. Obviously, um, the, the it was Inoue that landed that detonated one rather than Rodriguez, but... Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, Rodriguez. To, um, you know, not not many people might have might have heard of him that were tuning in last night. But he is no more. Um, he ge genuinely, you know, um, a, a, a genuine IBF, you know, world, world uh, belt holder is, has been iced basically, absolutely iced. I mean, we can all talk about the first left hook that put him down, but to follow it up with that body shot, I mean, you could see in his face he was he was you know. Just oh, just damaged. But oh, he was he was oh. fucked up, mate. He was fucked up badly. I mean, I think I, I think I was a broken nose, you know, with the first knockdown. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, but normally, um, with the, with these body shots, you see guys on the floor struggling to get up, you know, at, kind of, you know, after the shots landed and after they've gone down. But you could see even before he'd even started to go down, instantaneously, you could just see that his face. That the, the fight was the fight was over at that point if it wasn't already from the first knockdown. Um. Yeah, just the, the 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 facial expressions and his whole body just knew then. I mean, it was absolutely fantastic. Well, too Smid, fantastic. say it, mate. Say it, mate. Say it. You could see it when he was on when he was on his knee, shaking his face, and that he was like, oh, I'm, yeah. a Port, "I'm a Puerto Rican." Yeah, <laughs> I'm a Puerto. It Rican. was like a, it was like Curtis Stevens. I thought against Golovkin, it was like an iconic. <laughs> Woo! Shit. shit. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you have 
it's easy, it, it, even for, for, you know, for, for people like me, but it's easy for people to say, oh, this NUA, you know, is, is, is blowing through everyone. Is he fighting anyone any good? Um, yes. I mean, we all know about we all know that um, about Jamie McDonald's struggle, you know, Skeletor at the time, but he got iced in around. Payano, very very good fighter, iced in around, and then Rodriguez, possibly even better than the other two, iced in two rounds. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous what this what this you know young man is doing in only his 18th fight last night. Um, I thought it was fantastic that he, that he was over in um, Glasgow, and I know the. Um, the World Boxing Super Series. I've done a couple of nights where they've had two fights on on the same night at the same venue, um, but this was by far the be- the best um, two fights that they've had on one night. I thought it was fantastic to get him over there. Um, you know, there's people going up that you know that we know from from the pod kind of thing going up just to just to see um, just to see the monster in the flesh. I thought that was fantastic and a night that will be remembered. And um, I mean, Andy will know better than me, but. You know, it looked like there was quite a few Japanese in the crowd as well, which is, which again is a is a great sign. And um, Japanese fighters aren't known for for really really travelling, but that's something that he's got to do being part of this tournament. I was pestering the poor bastards because I was trying to find out where I could get this uh, NUA T-shirt from, and right. it took it took me about three years to find one that could actually speak English. You know, so yeah, yeah. No, I think that's I think that's a, a great sign. Um, you know, he's only 26, and he's you know there's going to be plenty more nights like this as well. Where he goes after the tournament, I. I honestly don't know. That's probably one for Andy to answer. But I think that, yeah, yeah I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a shame for Don here because, um, you know, we all we all love him for what he's done in and out the ring. I mean, outside the ring in the last two, two three, four years, he's become a bit of a, a bit of a cult hero, really, and deservedly so. Uh, you know, we've been doing going to schools and doing little fan meetups and everything. Great, great guy. Um, you know, he's kind of rebuilt himself after that um, Walters loss a few years ago where he got iced. He's come back down in weight. Um, and you know he's he's, he's made it made a right go of it in in this tournament. I know he, uh, it's a shame he didn't fight Tete. Cause I I didn't know that until last night that te- that that Tete that fight didn't happen. That's a shame. Um, it's a shame that, as well. Tete hadn't fought Burnett. You know, there's been a couple of instances. There. Yeah, and I think that on uh, that on paper, obviously, we know what's happened to Tete and Burnett, which is a shame. But on paper, this eight that were put together for the bantamweight for me is that I know the first cruiserweight instalment was good, but I think this was even better on paper. It's just a shame a couple of them have fell away. Um, I mean, Tete is very inactive, but it would be good if it would be good if he knew I could possibly fight him after the tournament. Not you know, but possibly there's not enough money in it or interest to be fair, so that might not happen as well. But where does he go next, Andy? After assuming he beats Donny? Who? Um, hmm. I think I like to see him stay at Bantamweight for a wee bit. To be honest, yeah, so I, yeah. um, obviously the WBC title. Um, you've got Tete there as well. Obviously, I mean that was a natural fight we all wanted to see at some point. Um, yeah, I like to see him. Um, obviously, you've got the Maloney. Um, Jason, I think it's Jason. I think it is. Actually. I think Andrew's up. It's I forget what way he's. It at. is Jason, I think, but he'd walk through him, wouldn't they? Quadras is is he at Bantamweight now? Oh, I think he right. moved up as well. So old Ted Head. Pedhead, Paul Butler had a win there last <laughs> night as well. Fucking hell, Andy. <laughs> what are you endorsing here? <laughs> Sick <Whoa>. bastard. <laughs> what, about, what about Regal? <laughs> well, yeah, that's be- that's better than Butler, Jesus. <laughs> oh, by the way, I've, I'm friends with uh, Joseph Abeko on Facebook, actually. I noticed he had a win there recently. I think he's, I think he's new ranked, like, top five WBO and that, so... Oh, God. Prince Patel. <laughs> He's, he's, he's fighting Patel he's and fight, Paul Butler in the same night. He's fighting next week in the Egypt, I think, as well. Eh? He's like ranked seven with the WBO, I believe. Forget about Joseph Agbeko, Andy. It's all about Joseph Ajayo. Yeah, so I, to be honest, you know, seriously, though, I want to see him kind of like pick up the belts if he can dominate the division. But I think um, move one twenty two is obviously going to be the move up at some point. But is he now twenty what twenty seven? Twenty six, I think. Twenty six. So he's going he's going to be filling out again at some point. I think. I mean, he started off at light fly, um, possibly. I think you know he would come in as as a kind of maybe a lighter version of one twenty two and that. But mm. mm, one twenty six, I think, is an absolute push. You mean on? It, it, it need to be like a big, big money fight. I mean, can you imagine him fighting like just say for example, say he skips uh, one twenty two right now and goes to one twenty six and fights Oscar Valdez. You know. It's just yeah. it's, it's inconceivable to think about that. that think minute, of someone you know. like Quig at that weight who's absolutely gigantic. Yeah. Well, I think Quig is up at one thirty now, as you know. Hasn't he gone up again? As he right? I think he has, I. But um, 
even even Carl Frampton, you know, if you if you think about the size of him, you know, we've all kind of met him and stuff. So he's a, he's a small one twenty six. Mm. So you can maybe put him, you know, in that kind of same frame and that, you know. So interesting to see. Uh, Smith, I mentioned Nicholas Walters there. There's a name from the past. Whatever happened to him? Great things expected, not delivered. A few of the guys in the chat: Stephen McGuinness, Danny Young, Nathan Newman, all saying about how friendly the Japanese were. Last night, apart from Inoue, Rob, not too friendly in the ring anyway. What about Ant's comments, Rob, that if Inoue has to learn English, he could become an absolute breakthrough star? Well, as Father Ted said, the Japanese are a great bunch of lads. Uh, <laughs> Inoue was With a lampshade just... on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Inoue was sensational. Sensational. Um, I tell you what, to throw a left hook like that and then to go back down to the body was such a mean shot while they're trading. Like that, you know, we always talk about levels on the podcast, and it's almost, you know, worn out phrase, but there really is levels where you're talking about elite levels. Like he decks him with a left hook, and Rodriguez had confidence after the first round because he was landing. So he thought, like, fuck this guy, I'm going to back him up and see what he's made of. And then he got that reminder the left hook was like a sledgehammer, and then the shot to the body afterwards was like a rifle. You see him on the ground, and he's looking at his corner, like, no, get me, get me the fuck out of here. Like, oh, I have to get back up. And he's just looking for the ground again when he gets back up. Like it's had a beating out of him last night. And that's not, that's a guy who's, I know we see knockouts, we see fellas get rolled over every week, but this is a guy like who's taking shots off of top fighters on the way to being here. These are the, the best fighters in the world in this super series. That's what you're getting in every division. The best guys that are available in the division and there's no one left out. So they're, they're all mixing it. All the top guys are mixing it together. And anyway, it's just fucking obliterating them. Like, so you wouldn't hold out ho much hope for Paul Nonito. I think Nonito might go out on his shield in that fight. I think he might go out and try and knock Inoue out and just gamble on it. his own left hook um, and then come a cropper. But Inoue is something to behold. Like, sort of really like a sensational finish, a clinical finish. Better than the Wilder one to me because of the way he did it, the science to it. To go back down to the body when you have a guy gone from a headshot, the natural tendency is to go and hit him in the head again. Like, But to go straight back to the body and with such a clinical shot just shows what level he's on really Rob question for you from Kevin Chase he said after Inoue's brilliant knockout last night where would you place him in the mythical pound for pound list he's a three weight world champion is that worth more than Crawford winning all the belts in one division I think you could make an argument says Kevin for him being in the top four well he's definitely up there I mean it's not a division that inspires me greatly historically I've paid more attention to the lower weight since coming on the pod to be honest with you I know Andy does a lot of um, uh, research into the Japanese side of things and everything and he's obviously been, you know for years talking about it anyway like so he's there's a reason they call him the monster he's definitely in there like I mean if you put away it's how you're putting away top guys and he's absolutely buzzing through them like there's not it's not even nobody's even giving him a fight so he has to be up there but to me Lomachenko Crawford um, Canelo are ahead of him um, just in terms of level. he's up there he's definitely up there for sure I just slightly lost Rob I don't know whether that was me or not but we've got him back anyway for the for the business end of the, the point there thank you Rob uh, Smido sticking in Scotland what about Ivan Baranchik against Josh Taylor? I was tweeting away last night saying how much I love Taylor. He has a bit of skill. He has a bit of will. He has grit. He's not afraid to stay in the pocket even when it's detrimental to his face. Although I thought he looked pretty good after the fight, to be honest. Didn't take too much punishment. But Baranchik, he's just a heavy guy. He's, he's, he's stocky. He's well set. He can punch. But Taylor showed he can outbox him and he can stand with him. I love me a bit of Josh Taylor. Yeah, I loved it. Loved it, Steve. Um Again, just a bit of a tip in my cap to the show in general. I mean, we've got arguably the the best pound for pound fighter in the world um, on uh, on one side of the card, and then we've got um, Josh Taylor, that's probably the best pound for pound boxer in Britain. Um, fantastic! I really, I really quite enjoyed the fight. I mean, as you can probably guess, I've never um, watched Ivan Baranchik fight before, but um, he was kind of typical of what they, I was expecting in terms of um, how he was described before the fight. Um, you know, compact Eastern European kind of, you know, tough, tough guy. And that, that's what he turned out to be. I think another um, 20 or 30 seconds of round six, it would have been, it would have been done. Um, I thought that was, a, I thought that was some good, good, good work from Taylor, obviously. Um, I thought he was ready to go then, but got to give credit to uh, Baranchik because, you know, I thought he recovered very well from that, from being down twice in one round. Um, 
he recovered to make it competitive pretty much for, for the rest of the fight, including including round seven itself. So um so yeah, I thought I thought fair play there. Um Josh Taylor was obviously the deserved winner. But as you say, Steve, he's got he's got the ability to mix it up. Um you know, he, he could have quite easily, you know, um boxed um and done a bit of a bit of a running man impression, but you know, he he, he got um stuck in throughout. Um I thought he um was working the body well. Uh, combinations to the body and finishing to the head was eye-catching and working well. I thought they were both throwing some really meaty punches. I think Andy might be able to report on that um, from a live perspective. But yeah, there was really there really was um, winging in, and I, and I just um, I just thought fair play to to Josh Taylor. Definitely, he was uh, varying up the jab. I think his corner were telling him that um, he was uh, switching a little bit as well. Like I say, working the body. I, I really enjoyed it, and I would. I'd, I'd tune in to watch Josh Taylor every time he fights. Absolutely no problem. Yep, if was, you get Smido tuned in, then good stuff there. And yeah. the, was the title uh, on the line, Steve? Sorry. Was the title yeah, the line? IBF, super lightweight title. Taylor had some kind of weight discrepancies, yeah. but that was maybe overblown, wasn't it? Yeah, I think there was, there was definitely some confusion. But yeah, I mean, yeah, fair play, fair play. Andy, Danny Young was reminding me in the chat about the scores there. Also, Paul Massingham jumped in on Facebook. He said, what a brilliant fight, but I did think the scorecards were a little wide without knockdowns. Maybe only one or two rounds in, it says Paul. So the scorecards, Andy, let's have a look. A couple of 115, 111s, which I didn't think was completely out of the realms of possibility. But Levi Martinez is 117, 109. A few people thought it might have been a little bit on the wide side. Yeah, I was a bit wide there. 115, 111, probably, probably fair. Um... I thought uh, it was a really good fight, actually. I mean, obviously, you know, Taylor showing his class early and stuff, and then um, parrying shots, and you know, he, he got the ropes sometimes and stuff. But it was more kind of after the kind of knockdowns and that, where Branchip was kind of like you know teeing off at the body and that. But if Taylor just stays off the ropes and stuff, he, but that, that, that was when he was doing his best work. But obviously, Branchip when, when he was up against the ropes and that, he was managing it you know, some decent shots and that off. But um, I did think you know at some point that Branchip was getting you know. We be overconfident, you know, because they were trading big vicious hooks and stuff. And they were, you know, as Smiddle says, you know, for a life perspective, that some of the, the, the punches that had everything on them. But um, I do think that you know, if you look at Baranchik and that as well as I think Taylor's obviously slightly struggling with the weight. Baranchik's obviously kind of smallish at the weight, but he's he is stocky. He's very kind of well built and that. But I thought oh, he was really gassing. Um, around about the sixth and uh, sorry, seventh and eighth and that. But um, I, I did think as well that Taylor's probably kind of slowing down around about the. I think it was around about the sixth or maybe even the fifth, actually, because, as again, as I say, I, I don't know if the weight is a significant issue, but um, I think he was like something, a few inches over or whatever it was, but um, in the end, you know, he's, he's probably made it and that, but it'll be interesting to see after his tournament and that as well as if he's going to hang about for much longer. But um, no, I did think um, as, uh, as, as a fight war on and stuff like that, that probably Branchick definitely going into the 12th, but definitely... 11 and 12 rounds, he needed a knockout. And um, just, you know, he, he'd been out and try, try and get it and that, but um, he just couldn't pull it off. But in the end, you know, people, I'm, I'm going to say that, you know, at this point in that, uh, Taylor has been fast tracked. And to be honest, I've been really impressed, you know, with his progress as far. Excellent, that. excellently managed, I think, and matched. Yeah, definitely. You know, he goes, I think he's now the, uh, he's either the 13th now or the 14th Scottish world titleist, I think he is now. But, um, that aside, you know, I did think um, his, his body punch and that, which I think, I've not watched the fight back, so I'm, I'm only going off what I can remember, actually, but I thought he had some slight problems trying to kind of land body shots and that as well, because obviously Branchick was smaller, he, they kind of like, he, he was kind of covered yeah. up the body pretty well in that yeah, as well. he was, Andy, he was, yeah. Some it was kind of like, you know, was, I remember at least once he was complaining about a low blow, maybe even twice, maybe, but um but definitely at some point in that as well as, you know, I just think that the precision punching for, for, for Taylor was you know, was far better and he was just more than a worthy winner. And um, as I say, as well, probably fatigue in the end really kind of, you know, done Branchick as well because he was, you know, he was doing everything he could actually kind of remain competitive in the fight and that as well. And obviously, have the two knockdowns against you and that, so you get, probably do get kind of a wee bit desperate, but um, no, nah, I just couldn't stem it. And Josh, again, in my opinion, was just um, far classier. Andy, just moving forward, looking on there, the guys are talking about the Progray fight. I think it's an excellent fight. Uh, Fatty Folks said he thinks Progray will dominate him. I completely disagree. I don't see anybody at that weight dominating. And I'm not saying that would have beat Taylor. I would maybe make Progray a slight favourite, but dominate him, no way. 
No, I wouldn't do- say dominate. No, I'm I'm going to go back and watch the um, the fight against the uh, Kale Relic because obviously when I, w- I can't remember much about it and um, I was kind of lying tired at the time. I might even fell asleep during it. But um, no, I'm not going to say it's going by domination. I, it's going to, definitely, I'm going to say it's a 50-50 fight. Um, probably, again, as I say, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to say 50-50 at the minute. I'm not going to pick a winner. I'm going to sit and think about it. But um, you could definitely see either guy winning this fight. Taylor, you know, I don't think he... he maybe maybe his, his issues with the weight, if there is a problem, maybe it kind of affects his kind of punching. But, um, you know, Progre, obviously, as well, his punching power is, you know, it's, it's to be respected, but um, it's still to be kind of seen against, um, shall we say, a kind of more top-level fighter. And um, we believe Josh Taylor to be a top-level fighter, certainly a, a level above Kiro Relic anyway. So um, it'll be interesting to see how Josh handles that power and if he can put a dent in progress as well. So what to think about. But um, again, he can, he can definitely kind of tax the body in that as well, Josh as well, pretty well. So it'll be interesting to see if Progray is hiding any, hiding any glass and that as well mm. to the body. So we'll wait and see. That's a good point, yes. We haven't seen Progray's chin or body truly tested yet. Um, the guys in the chat as well going on about the matchmaking. I've had my issues with the McGuigans over the years, but I can't fault them on Taylor. I think they've done a great job. And Shane McGuigan has proven himself to be a good trainer. So there you go. Rob, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I get a load of predictions wrong. But uh, Vince Cummings was uh, messaging me during the week, asking me uh, bits and pieces. And we got on to the Taylor fight and he said, how do you think it'll go? And I said, verbatim, I think Taylor will win, but I reckon he'll, he'll have his hands full. Uh, Baranchik isn't technically the best, but he's strong and can punch. That's a W for me, I think, Rob. Yeah, well, he went one better than me because I went on the double uh, stoppages for Taylor and Inoue. And I would have been mad if I had a back there because uh, Josh had him down twice. But... No, yeah, I think Taylor showed his class um, throughout this tournament and beforehand. I mean, we spoke about him last week. He's got lovely technical skills. He's got a good amateur background. He can bang a bit. He seems to have a good chin. He has a bit of spite when he gets a guy hurt and he knows when to box. And he's beaten a couple of high-level guys now. So you have to give him credit. A deserved world titleist. Um, how long he can hang on to it, I don't know. Can he unify now with Progre? I hope so. And I think he has attributes that could definitely help him in the progress fight to make it a tough contest. But progress seems to be a bit of a buzzsaw. So we'll see if he's able to box uh, to a decisive win against progress soon. But I wouldn't begrudge him if he could do it. He's been fantastic so far um, since he's come into the spotlight. He's done everything that's asked of him. So hopefully now the Scotland gets behind him and, and really rallies for him because like, he deserves it. Certainly does. Before we go on to Saunders, Andy, you were there live and in person. Not a real great deal on the undercard to get excited about, but I mean, I'll forgive them for that, the fact they put on these two fantastic fights. Paul Butler, the guys were saying, looked pretty decent against Salvador Sanchez. Uh, knocked him out Chabon. in the sixth round. <laughs> uh, Zach Parker has got, well got a win. And also Lee McGregor, Andy, didn't realise he was only 5-0 and going on 6-0. and No, he's already the Commonwealth champion, isn't yeah. he? So he's been moved pretty well. I didn't catch Lee McGregor because his mm. fight was a... I think it was... Five past six, he was on. And, okay. uh, so I was in the pub in that uh, with Tommy in that. But um, no, I seen I didn't catch Martin G. Ward either. And Cameron, I think, was on early doors as well. So I missed her. I seen Reese McFadden. He dominated his his opponent. Uh, Butler, as you say, um, basically kind of led a beat down in that Sanchez. And uh, Zach Parker just overwhelmed uh, that. I think it was Grandpart or Grandpert, whatever his name was. I don't know if Tommy Philbin actually even fought, actually, because I know he was a floater as well. So. Um, Oh no! Actually, it was a it was a good night because you know the worst thing about cards and that, especially if you go live and you you go in like a you know a few hours before the casuals get in before the main event and stuff. You want to see knockouts because there's nothing worse when the undercard sucks tits and it's like every fight goes to distance six rounders, eight rounders, four rounders and stuff, and then you get to the main event and that ends up being shit and that as well. But no, last night was was fantastic. There was a few sprinkle of knockouts on the undercard. Few go to points, and uh, you know the two the two main fights delivered in spades. So um, yeah, I'm happy. And he's happy. That's a good sign. Talking of things delivering or not delivering, Billy Joe Saunders over in Stevenage against Shefat Isufi. Didn't get to see Smid, the Joe Joyce, Alexander Ustinov fight because it was on at the same time, I think, uh, as Taylor Baranchik, and there was no way I was turning over for that. At the end, I did go over to Saunders just in time to see him getting buzzed in the sixth round by Mr. Isufi. And then in the eighth round, Smido, my stream gave up 
and it refused to come back on. In the eighth round of Saunders is Sufi, my stream just packed up and just wouldn't reload. Is that a sign, Smith? Steve, I've got quite a, quite a simple um, breakdown of this fight. I ain't watching that shit, and I, I didn't watch it, and I will not be watching it. I've I seen the highlights, by the way. I, can, I just say that that guy, he, he, well, he buzzed Saunders definitely twice, I thought. But um, he needs to get back his cell back to uh, 160 and fast. He doesn't belong up there. Calum Smith next. Dude, you're uh, kidding me on, man. Calum Smith will walk through him. Seriously, he will Well, he fights him, though. I mean, you've got Callum Smith, you've got Kell Brook, and you've got Billy Joe Saunders, Andy, all going for boxing's most irrelevant champion. The WBC should get on that one. Yeah, I'll make um, a, 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 some sort of shitty inner city belt or something like that, you know, made out of trash cans and stuff, hubcaps or whatever, not for Liverpool. Um, ah, it's just shit, man. I mean, wait, wait, wait. Callum Smith will seriously do him some damage. I, I really don't care what anybody says. You know, Saunders is a good boxer, but at 168 against a guy like that, with his leverage, fuck, no chance, man. He doesn't belong up there. He doesn't belong at 168. What about the scores, Andy? I thought he was definitely buzzed in the six, but one judge gave it a shot out, didn't they? I did. As I said, mate, I only watched the highlights, mm, so yeah. I didn't. I didn't watch. Uh, so I, I can't really kind of comment on the scores no, and stuff. But yeah, no. it was just. It is what it was, and it, it was, I don't know if it was cherry picked somehow, but um, it was just a typical Warren boxing organization title defense title fight type thing, you know. The most underwhelming two weight world champion, I suppose, it's a sign of the times, isn't it? You got guys like Broner calling themselves what six weight world champions. Saunders is a two weight world champion. It's a good achievement, but in the context, this is the visual context of that achievement. Adrian Broner calls himself a three, was that a three four weight world <laughs> champion. It, yeah. You know, fucking Robert hell. Guerrero, seven weight world. <laughs> oh, did he, man? Seven Aye. time world champion, isn't it? Aye. It's. Anyway, let's move on. On the undercard, uh, I just noticed there, Boy Jones Jr. lost to 8 0 Sean Cooper, so well done to him. Rob, I'm not going to burden you with any of this card. You can talk about Saunders against Isufi if you want, but I want to get your opinion on something that happened on the undercard. It was a good fight between Brad Foster and Ashley Lane, ending up with Foster stopping Lane in this unification, British and Commonwealth, with about seven seconds to go of the 12th round. But something happened in that 12th round that has been pissing me off a little bit, and it's the issue of the low blows. Do you think, like me, Rob, maybe this is a stupid thing that just annoys me, but I think that guys sometimes don't take the full time. I'm not saying they have to take the full five minutes, but even a couple of minutes because they feel under pressure to get back out under the action. See, when Ashley Lane took a low blow, right, he was clearly hurt. It was clearly a low blow. He was never going to take the five minutes because the fans start getting a bit annoyed after a minute mm. or two. The referee was visibly patting him on the tits, like going, come on, son, get back out here, encouraging him to come out before he was ready. Do we have to investigate the low blow situation? situation well i remember um after crawford allegedly hit canlow um i think it was andy lee or some of them talking afterwards saying that the fighters never take the five minutes you know we we heaped a lot of pressure on amir for saying all right take the five minutes if you really got hit low but they never do really so they either walk back in early or they just ham it up a little bit and lie down roll around like or whatever like but I don't know, like, people, the crowds definitely don't like people taking a full five minutes, so you can see how a fighter would, especially in a, in the 12th round of a fight, high octane, that he makes the decision to, to get back into it, like, from, from pressure from the crowd. And well, the, the referee tapping him to come back out as well, like, you know, he was, like, sort of saying, come on, come on. Yeah, no, well, the ref shouldn't like do it. that, like, mm. well, the ref shouldn't do that. If, he give, if he's giving him the five minutes, you should give him the five minutes, you know what I mean? It takes a strong character, Rob, is what I'm saying. You can imagine someone like B-Hop. They're all booing. He's swaggering around the ring like, fuck you, the more you boo, the more I'm going to take. Yeah. You have to have a strong personality, I well, think. Poor, poor B-Hop was victim to some vicious low blows from Joe Calzaghe uh, <laughs> that night. Absolutely Why disgraceful. This Calzaghe should have been DQ'd for blatant low blows to uh, the great B-Hop's cup. Uh, what did he say to Max afterwards? Something. I'll never get beat by a white man. No, that was he didn't say that. To, come on, come on, Spino. Let's not talk Brexit. Um, the, he said that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'll never get interviewed by a white man, Max. Fuck off. <laughs> no, he said to Max. He said, "That's your crotch, Max. Where's your crotch?" <laughs> <laughs> Why? Do, I've got a solution to this five minutes, Steve. Why don't you yeah. just reduce it to two minutes, and it's more acceptable for everyone? Fight a crowd, ref, everyone. Just reduce it to two minutes. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Point. Takes two minutes. No one even takes a minute, really. Never mind five. 
So why don't you just reduce it to two? It's more acceptable for everyone. And if you want two minutes, take two minutes. Yeah. Suppose it all takes two to make a thing go right. No, <laughs> <laughs> well said, Rob. Well said. Yeah, Amir took the full 15, I think. But uh, fair play to him anyway. Maybe it's just me. The guys in the chat saying about Brad Foster. He does look like a decent British champion. So we'll be interested to see where he goes from here. Rob, anything on Saunders at all? No? What, you don't want my insight on Chef Kadasuki? Uh, what's his name? What's his Arthur name? Abraham 2.0, Sheffit Asufi. Sheffit Asufi. Allegedly, he's a cruiserweight coming down, isn't he? So maybe that's why he uh, he buzzed him with, with the shot. Like He's supposed to be a big puncher with, uh, with that's actually a cruiserweight. So I don't know if that's true or not. I just heard Ben Davidson say it. Um, I don't know. I always thought Saunders, like if, if he moved up and looked to part at 68, it kind of jabbed the head off Callum Smith. But then looking at him last night, um, you're not so sure. So I don't know. Like, where, where does he go now, Saunders? Because if he wants to make some money, he's not going to fight Canelo, is he? Because he's not going to be on the zone. I don't know if they're going to do cross pr promotion or whatever. So he's not going to be on that platform. Um, the only fight at 68 for him to make a few bob is, unfortunately, our old friend Chris Eubank Jr. No. Maybe that's where he should go because no. I don't think his heart is in it, to be honest with you. It just, it just doesn't give me that impression. No, I agree. And he has to move down to middleweight. He's got no business being up at super middleweight. Uh, light heavyweight, Andy. Quick one on you. Willie Hutchinson, is he going anywhere? He always looks a bit soft to me. I think he could maybe slim down. Um, was he on that card last night? Yeah, he won. I mean, obviously, you haven't seen it. I, I didn't uh, watch it either. Just generally, is he one to watch? I've not seen him uh, much, mate, since he turned pro. I think I've seen mm. two of his fights and that. He was obviously highly tight to come out the amateurs and that. Um, but I think he's he's quite young for it. I think he's like twenty one or something. Like that. I think he's just going to take a bit of time with him, fill him out, and see how he goes. Now, but it could be one of the, the those ones where it might stagnate a wee bit. Like, yeah, we'll keep an eye on him. I don't know how far he's going to go, but there you go, guys. Uh, Hector Camacho Junior is in action. Well, he was in action. He won against Victor Abreu, fifty eight seven and one now up at super middleweight. So that was in Alabama. Going well over in Delaware, Hector Camacho. We'll see more from him, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Smido, coming to you in a minute with a question on Usyk. Before we do, Rob, on Friday night, I don't know if you got to see any of this card. I didn't go in the Ulster Hall, but I watched it on IFL TV. First of all, tell me about Ryan Burnett getting back against Gelbert Gamera. Fair play to the matchmaker. I thought Gamera, he looked a little bit heavy, but he came and he had a good go. Yeah, standard enough wins, though, still from Burnett. Like, you would have expected him to do the business. Um, and Deco, where does he go now, like? Um, I, we're looking like mugs here, Rob. We're looking like mugs. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> MMA like, apparently getting kicked did, in the I, head. That's just what he needs. Yeah, Jesus. Like, um, we kind of alluded to it, like about examples of fighters living the life. And to me, I, like I said, I don't know him completely outside the circle. Like, this is just from like looking at the the media stuff. But to me, it seems like he's a guy that hasn't focused on his career, but he had all the talent, and he's getting exposed now against kind of average level guys because they're able to find him and they've got a more a kind of a, a more of a pro's toughness to them or something. I think his style now is just just doesn't suit the pros. Like he's good at getting in and out but he can't mix it. So you know a hell of a shot. And he's up on Twitter saying today enjoyed every second of it until he went to sleep. He fucking only <laughs> twenty three <laughs> rounds like why you why you couldn't have enjoyed it that much. The fight wasn't on that long like so that's uh, a pity. It's I I I really I was rooting for him because like I said last week it, you know in Ireland we don't see many fighters with that style it's just a pity he hasn't got the he hasn't got the the the, the nous as a pro I don't think to cut it at the top level well it's obvious he doesn't like I mean John o, there's no shame in losing to John o. I think John O's shown he can operate at world level but the other two losses against guys he think he should be beaten with a guy of his ability like but credit to McCulloch as well like obviously you know, I don't want to take anything away from him it's not all about Deco like He's gone in there. He's got. He's done the job. He's done what's asked of him. He's got an emphatic knockout. Like, and hopefully he can go on now. So, yeah, we knew Ger Gerrity was talented, but you know he purchased his gas tank from the David Price Superstore, and now he's leaving his chin up in the air as well to get hit. Fair play to Marco, known him since he turned pro. He's had his ups and had his downs, but if Gerrity's aspiring to any decent level, just finally, Rob. I mean, he was talking Tevin Farmer in two or three fights. If he got past McCulloch, I mean, it's it's bordering on delusional. Oh, it's completely delusional. Like it's completely delusional, and it's all this kind of, you know. I know we talk about the fighters of old, like they didn't go on like this, but obviously they didn't have technology wasn't as advanced that you know someone hasn't got a phone in your face twenty four seven. But some of the stuff they come out with, like 
uh, with all this positive thinking mindset and like you know supreme confidence it's like it's all well and good like as if you're if you're if you're wilder and you say you're gonna put someone in a coffin you go out and snatch them like that then you can say you're the man but if you say all that shit and then you get iced it's just you know what i mean people stop believing you know what i mean Yep, never stop believing, says Rob Kelly. A message for us all there, some a positive message on a Sunday evening. Time, time stamp that one. Time stamp I, that I one. I had a question. I had a question actually for Andy. Go on. If if Josh Taylor was able to be pro great, does he go up there with Scotland's best ever? No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, Ken Buchanan still the get still the man. Yeah, you know, I mean, nobody, nobody until until okay, if Josh somehow. You know, Wins all the titles and that, and goes and like unifies and that. Um, maybe a, a few defenses and that. But you need to remember, Buchanan actually went on the road, won his world title on the road, I believe, and um, defended it on the road. I don't even think he actually defended his title in the UK. Actually, in all honesty, I think there was some sort of dispute with the WBC and the British Board of Control. I think, but um, is he better than Jim Watt? Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely would say that. I mean, so Jim Watt. There. Yeah, I would say definitely. But um, um, I need to sit and break it down. Actually, but um, we've not really had a lot of kind of fighters that you know, obviously had longevity. I would say in terms of like, mm. uh, pro careers uh, at the very top. But um, Buchanan, for example, when after he lost the title and stuff, he came back and he he, he won the British title against Jim Watt, for example. I mean, because a lot of fighters would have they gave up after losing the world title, they're retired. Mm. You know, he should have got the five minutes. Aye, <laughs> I, he should have got the five minutes. I but he hosted Duran and then he, he beats probably well, I was going to say a washed up Carlos Ortiz. He then beats Jim Watt and then he goes on and wins the European title. I think it was either. Denmark or Italy won it in or whatever. And he got another chance at the at the world title um against Itsumizu in Japan. Mm. Went fifteen rounds and I think it was quite like close to cards and that as well. And he came back and he'd want he'd defend the European title on the road. So um it's just kinda of latter half his career and that he started kinda of, you know taking taking the L's and that. But um no, Ken Buchanan is still uh, number one of all time as Scottish boxers in this country, definitely. Mm. Shout out, Andy. Yeah, the chat going wild there, talking about... Um, I noticed Martin McGuinness was mentioned there. I remember being at a show in Letterkenny many years ago. Uh, Paul McCluskey against Caesar Bazan, I think it was off the top of my head, at ringside. Took a step back, trod on somebody's foot. Sorry there, pal. It was old uh, Martin McGuinness himself. He took it well, though, took it. <laughs> no, you're no beef. Me, you're reminding me, was it Danny's uh, assessment in the chat of, of Danny Wilder's power? Never! <laughs> Never. <laughs> when, when he said, uh, "Wilder's power is like the IRA's threat to Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s." <laughs> we only have to be lucky once, but you have to be lucky all the time. Fucking hell, Donny. Yeah, that was a bizarre analogy from Donny, wasn't Jesus it? <laughs> Donny's Don, Don, Donny's one of those Americans with Irish ancestry, so he thinks he's, like, he's uh, on board. Uh, so he, he, he thinks he thinks he's like say, he thinks he's staunch, he thinks he's always so, he thinks he's fucking like a proper rebel Republican and all that sort of stuff, you know. So. They are the worst. Uh, man. I remember being on tour in Boston and I met. Well, with he's from New England as well, isn't he? So obviously he thinks he's like say, he's a fucking. Well, well, I was on tour in Boston and it was guys like trying to get like the Irish slang, but saying it wrong, so they're using shite, but they're using shite like as if it's shit. So they're saying like, listen, man. I'm not down with that shite. You know what I mean? That shite <laughs> to me is, and I'm just like trying to break it down. So I'm like, sorry to break your heart, man. You're using that in the wrong context. Don't ever say that again. Anyway, sorry, I digress. <laughs> no problem. We love a digression, especially from you, Rob. All those stories, well-traveled gentlemen, indeed. Rapping Rob Kelly, Smidos with us as well. Andy Patterson with me, Steve Wellings. We'll be going for another, oh God, well, maybe half an hour, three quarters of an hour. We'll see how we get on. Smido, question for you has come in on the Twitter from Kaiser Koba. I think he's talking about pound for pound here, Smid. He oh, said, God, that's not my specialist subject. Smido, this is your speciality indeed. You wait till you hear the question. You're the man for this job. Is it fair to rank Alexander Usyk definitively in the top five, says Kaiser Koba? The majority of people rank him over Triple G. Is that to say Brady, Gassiev and Bellew are all better than Triple G's resume? Or is it because of Triple G's age? Why is Usyk ranked so high, Smid, especially over Triple G? I think um, Usyk is rightly in the t in the top five. Um, yes. Of the of pound for pound, um, to my knowledge, he cleaned out at cruiserweight. There was no one. There was no one left. He didn't move up to heavyweight with any questions remaining over 
you know, he ha- he hasn't faced such and such, or he didn't he didn't get in the ring with him. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to think of other examples on on the top of my head, but you know, we off Billy Joe Saunders, for example, um, is a, apparently an undefeated fighter, um, has moved up without actually beating pretty much anyone at the at the weight that he was departing from. Um, whereas Usyk, there was there wasn't anyone else that he could have fought that was that was worthwhile. Um, he uh, obviously won the um, Super Series. Gassiev and Bradis were were more than worthy foes um, in in close in what were expected to be close fights, particularly you know with the bookmakers and stuff beforehand. Um, I think both Gassiev and uh, particularly Burdis will both come again. Gassiev probably not going to win a title at heavyweight, but he could definitely win one at cruiserweight, I, I reckon. Um, and then after the tournament, there was only one man kind of in the conversation that didn't enter the tournament, and he went and went and iced that motherfucker as well in Liverpool, which was fantastic. Um, in regards to Golovkin, um, I've discussed Golovkin at length on this podcast. One of my favourite fighters probably ever, and I say ever in terms of you know one while I've been a fan. Um, it just took so long for him, for him to fight anyone with with, with a name, um, um, particularly the biggest name of them all, Canelo. They kind of let him get old, particularly in the interim between the first match and the rematch. We know what went on there, but you know he was he's he's, in, he's getting old now, Golovkin, if not already definitively old. Um, and that was always the issue. I think even I spoke about that happening before it did. In terms of you know they just let you know he's he's getting old and no one wants to fight him and it, it's a real shame. Um, I would definitely have Usyk above Golovkin, uh, particularly at the moment, because whether we agree with it or not, uh, Golovkin uh, failed to beat Canelo in two fights, um, or, or you know lost lost one of them. Usyk's not got a loss on his record, and um, it's a shame. I think his fight against Takam was meant to be this weekend. It's a shame that that's. Um, I was going to ask you about that, Smith. It is a shame, isn't it? I was looking forward to that. Yeah, because it came on a bit of a good run with you know Joshua over this weekend, and then Usyk, and then um, sorry, Wilder, Usyk, Joshua, um, Fury's in and around soon as well. It, it was kind of a shame that we didn't see him, but for comparative comparative reasons, you yeah, know, to yeah, compare absolutely. them against each other, performance yeah. wise. Yeah. I think we was going to see all four of them kiddies in 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 four or five weeks of each other. So yeah, it would have been a good comparative. Um, but I think yeah, Usyk's. You know, it showed that he's not scared of um, taking on absolutely anyone. He don't care where it happens necessarily in terms of location. I think he's an absolute pleasure to to be, to behold. Um, as is uh, the likes of Inoue and Lomachenko, both are with you know not they've none of those guys have been caught up in politics as such really yet, have they? Um, and that's that's as, that's the mark of a of of, an, of a fan favorite really in this day and age. So yeah, fit. Fair play to him. I, like I say, I'd have him above Golovkin, and he's well and truly within the top five. I, I, again, I'm not no pound, pound expert, but I saw someone tweet earlier today that um, there is a clear top five at, at the moment. It's just whatever order you choose to put them in. So I think going off the top of my head, it's the likes of uh, Crawford, Usyk, Lomachenko, Inoue, and I think there was one other that you, I'm sure you can fill me in on. But yeah, there's five. There's, there's five kiddies, and it's up to you in what order to put them in, and that's that's the that's the um, good thing about the pound for pound because it always you know it creates debate, doesn't it, and, and conversation. So who's the other kid I've left out there? I've left someone out there. Who did you mention? Lomachenko, Canelo. Crawford. You missed Canelo. Canelo, yeah, that's it. Canelo? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're the five. Um, and whatever order you put you put them in, it, it is up to you. But I don't think we can I don't think we can safely argue that those five aren't in the top five, or that a another would, could uh, could dislodge one or more of those guys at the moment. Yeah, Rob, it's a shame that Usyk uh, isn't fighting to come. That was one of three heavyweight fights on the DAZN card. Michael Hunter's going in against Fabio Maldonado and Philippe Hergovic. It'll be interesting to see how he gets on in his US debut against Gregory Corbin, not Jeremy Corbin, who was last seen. <laughs> he was an, He's an eccentric character, this guy. He was fighting against... Uh, Prince Charles Martin, and he ended up getting himself disqualified. He was out of his oh, depth, really. Yeah, yeah, Hergovic yeah, yeah. will probably knock him out. Also, Rob, not heavyweight related. The main event, maybe the most underwhelming on the card for me. I like Devin Haney. Not really interested in Antonio Moran. Where's the value to be had on this one? Devin Haney with Mayweather potential. <laughs> Matchroom signing Devin Haney. What are you talking about, Steve? You're obviously not watching what all the rest of us are seeing. This guy has Mayweather potential. He I saw potential. him hitting a heavy bag against uh, Ryan Garcia or one of those, you know, one of those machines and apparently he and hit losing. it harder than Garcia. No, he won. He, Haney won. Oh, Haney he won. won. He won. Yeah. He won. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, he looks a good fighter. Last couple of times I saw him, I thought he should have dealt with guys better. 
He's obviously learned on the job. He was a kind of a one man band up until signing with the zone. So we'll see how he goes. I mean, he should dispatch this guy. This is a fight they're, they're going to obviously, if he's headlining it, they're not bringing the guy to, to win. Um, so we'll see what kind of fight Moran puts up and we see how Haney has good, like, I mean, he's got, he's got good skills. He's 20 he's as well. Good. He's only 20. Yeah, he's a good kid. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of pressure to heap on him, call him, saying that he has Mayweather potential. Like, Mayweather potential means you've got the potential to go your whole career undefeated while generating millions of dollars. I don't know if Devin Haney has all that, but uh, he's got nothing so far to say that he's a bad fighter. I think he's a um, decent operator and long power, a bit of power as well. So I like watching him fight, but I just don't think he's there yet. we see how he goes. Who else was on the undercard, did you say? Uh, Hunter, the, one of the guys in the chat, I can't remember who, was saying... Oh, Usyk was supposed to be. Yeah, Usyk idea. was supposed to fight Takam. They were mentioning Hunter in the chat, Rob. I think it was Gary Shaw. Did Hunter move up to heavyweight too soon? There could have been a bit of value at cruiserweight for him. Well, I am very feeling about that. Um, <laughs> I think it's just opportunity with Hunter in terms of matchroom, um, you know, the big three not fighting each other. He'll end up in with one of them kids. Why? Yeah, He'll probably. He'll end up in with Fury, White, Joshua, Wilder, definitely. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Uh, Chris Congo is fighting next weekend against Tyrone Nurse. Nice step up for him. I had this uh, set aside, by the way, for Ozzy, who wasn't able to join us tonight. That's in that's in the York Hall. John O'Donnell as well. His career lingers on like a dying parent. Uh, 33 and 2. He is Mr. O'Donnell. Let's see how he gets on. Andy, we were mentioning Carlos Quadras earlier. Uh, what's happening to him? Well, he's fighting against 15 and 6 Daniel Lozano on a top rank undercard next week in Florida. Also on that card is Jose Pedraza for the vacant WBO Latino title, no less, against Inez Antonio Lazada Torres. Never heard of him. He's in his 44th fight. But on the main event, and you can talk about Quadros if you want, it's Masayuki Ito. He continues to impress against Jamel Herring. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a decent fight, actually. Ito's the, the WBO champ who upset Christopher Diaz, wasn't he? I, I think it was, I, but... Um, I'm trying to remember what fight that was. Um, either way, but... Um... Sorry, on you go, mate. No, I was going to say, he went in for the vacant against Diaz. Diaz was expected to win. Ito upset him. He then knocked out the Russian, I think it was Chuprakov, in his first defence. And then maybe setting up Ito for... Who was it? was it? fight, surely. wasn't Stevenson. It was... Oh, who else had they got it down there? Oh, it was... Um, Burchell Stevenson. was calling him it. Oh, well, there you go. There, I knew it was, yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. Burchell was calling him it. Yeah, but... Oh, hey, oh, well, again, obviously, this is maybe kind of set up to obviously... I mean, like good now. I mean, I don't know much about Herring actually. To be honest with you, I just think is he not one of the fighters now who steps up and he, he maybe kind of falls short. Yes. Um. So I would think Ito is probably going to stop him late actually in this fight. If no, then probably comfortable on points, and then we can get on to unifying the division. So um, I've just pulled up the card there actually. So who else you got on it? Jose Pedraza against someone was it Ennis Torres? I've never heard of him. No, Coquietto's on the card and that as well. Oh. Mm. He must be getting pulled in as some sort of kind of prospect filler or whatever again. Ah, there he is. Cintron. Yeah, yeah. Cintron. Yeah. yeah, so not really much else on that card, actually. The report, I mean, Quadra's fighting an eight-rounder. Mm. No, but is that next Saturday? Yeah, so... See, to be honest, you know, see some of these top-ranked ESPN cards. I mean, give me your honest opinion on them, guys. I mean, see... Parfait obviously likes maybe Lomachenko and that, unless he's fighting some of the top draw, but the cars have been pretty shit so far this year. Or is it just me? Well, do you remember, Andy, me saying this a few weeks ago and people were dismayed? I said, I think there's too much boxing on at the moment. And, and ESPN is a prime example. The, the cards are really getting stretched out at the moment. Yeah, I just don't know if maybe top ranks got, got the actual stable at the minute. They kind of carry the dates they've got to kind of cover and that as well. Obviously, they've got to try and get the prospects the right fights at the right time and that, but. Yeah, it seems like Heyman has all the good fighters. Yeah, he's doing, definitely. Nothing, he's doing nothing with them, and Aram is kind of stuck with like shite. He's got the three superstars he's got Fiori, Lomachenko, he's got Crawford. Well, he's got the after... world division fighting each other, I suppose. Yeah, but after that, it's fucking pretty boring, like, isn't it? So, yeah, I, I could see it's just too many networks involved now, like, and all of them are making power plays. So, you're kind of seeing stars separated, and it's just nonsense, isn't it? Like, Bit of nonsense, says Rob. Uh, any interest, Rob, in Austin Trout returning? I think this is the short most short-lived retirement in history. He's in against Terrell Gosho. I thought he'd retired, Trout. 
What are we going next week at all? Shashan's like, shit. Yeah, this no, is it, man. It's the, it's the, the, the dregs it's drop. The, yeah, no, Aston <laughs> The dregs, the dregs. We're in the fucking slurry, Steve, for fuck's sake, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. Like Austin Trout had his moment seven, eight years ago, uh, getting a decision over Cotto that time. That was his highlight and a good competitive fight against Canelo. Um, and since then, he's had his moments and operated. And but look, since since he lost the hard, I don't I don't see the need to see him back. He's had a good career. Just call it a day, unless he needs the few quid. But like, where's this fight going to put him? Even if he wins, it's just I don't know. I would like to see him retire. He's getting on as well, isn't he, Austin Trout? Mm. Mm. So, he's had some hard fights as well I think yeah you know? big time big time big time he's not in the prove either so I don't know huge for that uh, weight as well mm. I wish he would have retired so but it's not to be Andy one thing you might be interested in we were talking a couple of weeks ago I think it was last Huey Friday Fury. Huey Fury. Well, well, I'm, get, I'm going to Smith on that in a minute but more interesting than Huey Fury for you Andy we were looking at Saul Farah's next fight it oh, didn't take I, place no. it's been it's been rescheduled for Friday the 24th of May he's going in against Cesar Mamani and also on the undercard Esteban Hillman Tababari 44 21 and 2 has Norton 1 Paolo Sanchez Noe so it's it's all going on in Bolivia yeah but I see he's also got another fighter range as well is he not going to is it the, is it the Philippines he's going is it the, oh, I was going to say Indonesia but there you go the Philippines he's fighting uh, Ronald Johnson <laughs> Ronald Johnson of America, right? He's a <sighs> 12 rounder. And by the way, Steve, I, I know we're talking about Huey Fury in depth and that, so I know we're going to be getting the hot stig on the phone shortly. So, um, do you want me to keep talking when we get him on? Hot stig, yeah. I should ring him up, shouldn't I, if I yeah. still have his number? I don't even know if I do. Let's have a look. Hot stig, no. Don't think I've got uh, his number anymore. I'm seeing the people in the chat and that basically demanding. Yeah, he comes on and stuff like that, get his hot take on, on matters. Here, by the way, see that picture of him and Russ uh, in the pub? I thought that mm. was a fucking, I thought it was a Photoshop until someone posted the fucking link up to the, to the YouTube video the other week. And I said, that's fucking like that. <laughs> I didn't care that was real. I thought they'd fallen out, but there you go. Yeah, we should we should get Stig on. But I haven't got his number, unfortunately, so not tonight, under. Hey, Rob's getting a lot of love in the chat tonight, by the way. It's Rob this, Rob that. I know, IRA. they're going, they're going wild about Rob tonight. Uh, Rob hates white people. <laughs> Rob hates the UVF. <laughs> hey, you Rob hates boxing. I don't hate anybody. I'm a lover, not a fighter. You know what I mean? Rob's a lover, not a fighter. There, the main streets of Wexford aren't the same since he's uh, packed up his gloves. Smido, let's get on to you, shall we? Back onto the boxing action. Huey Fury, indeed, is going against the mighty 17 and 0 Chris Norad. Uh, Steve Brogan on the undercard against Adam Haig. I'm wondering if Adam Haig is any relation to former WBF champion Damon Haig, who was around on the early McKennessy undercard. He might be, he might not. Also, a decent fight between friend of the pod, former guest, in fact, Alex Dilmajani. He had been off, <coughs> excuse me, sparring Juan Manuel Marquez, it might have been, or somebody. And he's in against Martin Parlaggi, who had a good fight a few years ago with Marco McCulloch. Forget about all that, Smido. I'm sure you don't care. What about Huey Fury? Are you underwhelmed by Chris Norad? Underwhelmed? I don't even... I've never fucking heard of him. I mean, I'm sure the Furies are in competition to, to see who can fight the most obscure shit heavyweights. I mean, fucking hell. I mean, Fury's in a bit... Uh, Huey's in a bit of a situation whereby we don't really know how good he is, if he's any good at all. He was good against Sam Sexton, then he got beat against Pulev, caught his own shit all since. Um, but, you know, he should really be in this mix in Britain with the, the likes of, you know, that second tier... Dubois, Joyce, Gorman, them kind of kiddies. He should be in that conversation, but he seems to be the only pe the only person that Mick Hennessy is really involved with. Um, what channel is this going to be on, Steve? Do we not? What what channel do you think, Smith? If you had to take a guess, I would say Channel Five. You would be right, sir. Oh, good, right, okay. So I mean, uh, so he's the only one left with Hennessy. We still don't know why the Furies have, have fell out, why Tyson's not training with Peter and all that. We still don't know why that, because no fucker dares talk about it. Um, and I would if I knew the answers, but I don't. I've not got a clue what happened. But no fucker talks about that. They talk about being loyal fighting men, then he's fucked his, then he's fucked his uncle off, fuck's sake. So, yeah, I mean, Huey Fury should be taking advantage of this, you know, uh, period of no one fighting each other. He should be putting himself in the British, definitely the British mix. He's not doing so. No one cares, particularly me. I don't give a fuck who is fighting or what he's doing this weekend because I won't be watching. 
Okay, Smido, I, I probably will watch this. Chris Norad is 17 and 0 with uh, eight knockouts. There you go. He's from Canada as well, and he's 35 years of age. Rob, I'm not going to ask you. Is he about... not an MMA fighter? I remember hearing that name before somewhere. Oh, he might be, Andy. There you go. I've no idea. No idea. We need Hater Dave on here to let us know about the ins and outs of the MMA. I'm starting to lose my voice a bit here. I must be come back too soon. Like I think Tyson maybe Rob. Like Tyson yeah. Fury. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to lose my voice. <laughs> That's pretty good. Got... That's Hater Is that because you've been licking out my chills or you felt by the way? Who me? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but giving half a chance. Oh my god, did you see that video of Tyson Fury lying in the bed and fixing her hair no, by the way? Oh you dusty. Leave bastard. some Isley brothers over it, that did. <laughs> <laughs> Fox B says drug abuse does that to the vocals. I can guarantee you, sir. No drug abuse here. But, Rob, uh, let's talk about Gennady Golov Golovkin, indeed. Uh, James Davis sent in a question for you. He said, off the back of Golovkin's switch to training with Jonathan Banks, coming as, as a surprise, if other top fighters were forced to change trainers, who would the pod recommend they switch to? Now, James said, someone on the pod said they'd have liked to have seen Triple G go to Robert Garcia, for example. Um, yeah, that was me. Uh, hang on, he's asked me another question, but I think it's uh, yeah. Ask, answer that one first. So, who who would you go to if you had the choice then, Rob? I think uh, Easter Junior could go with someone like Mike Breland, like we said before. I think mm. you'd see vast improvements in someone like him if he had a trainer that listened to him. AB needs a new trainer. I don't think he, any of the new school trainers could do anything with him. I don't actually. You know what? I don't think even Eddie Fudge or anything could do anything with Broner. So forget about him. Um. Other than that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I think everyone else is kind of doing an okay job. What do I know? You know well, you I mean? did a good job there, Rob, answering that, because the second part of James's question was uh, fighters with clear holes in their game, so you could recommend someone. So who would be able to stop Jared Hurd blocking punches with his nose and all that type of stuff? So I think he's looking stylistically. It's quite tough uh, off the bat, but, I mean, are the great trainers around, Rob? I was a shout-out to a New Age Boxing Podcast. They interviewed uh, Buddy McGirt this weekend. I listened to it earlier before I came on. Really interesting, insightful. Buddy spoke very well, Rob, about his relationship with the old-time trainer. Guys like Ray Arcel, um, Bowie Fisher, Eddie Futch, George Benton as well. All these guys who are no longer with us. And Buddy was quite scathing about the modern trainers, the modern strength and conditioning coach obsession. And just made me think, have we got these great trainers around at the moment? Well, it seems to be a lot of the trainers like to put themselves in the public eye these days with social media and stuff. They almost want to be bigger than the fighters sometimes. Like, now you're not bigger than the fighter. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's it, there's a lot of that egos with them and stuff. I don't know. Is there any great trainers left? Don't know. It remains well, to be seen think, what the fighters do. I think it's just, it, it can be draw parallels to football. You know, like now they've got you know managers don't actually manage players because they've got the agents involved and like you say the strength and conditioning, the managers, the yeah. promoters, the lawyers. We hear people talking about lawyers within boxing. Um, so yeah, yeah like, I, think, I just think there's too many people involved. Yeah. Bang on, like, for example, in the build-up to the Terence Crawford Amir Khan fight, they had a full six minutes or something with the fucking strength and conditioning coach talking about, you know what I mean? And this guy's getting his moment on camera. Everybody needs a piece of the pie these days, like... Yeah, one thing I'll say about promoters, of uh, promoters, no, trainers, I've said it before, I think sometimes some of the good trainers, the excellent trainers, maybe go under the radar. We see some guys, I'm not going to pick on like Tundi, but he's sort of outspoken and he's doing all these funny things and you have these celebrity trainers. Some people have accused the likes of Ben Davison as well of being a bit like this. But you have guys under the radar, I think, who are good trainers. I've mentioned it before. Jeff Horn's trainer. I was always really impressed with him. Um, whatever you think about Jeff Horn, I don't care, you know, about the Manny Pacquiao fight, all that type of stuff. I was just impressed with his corner, man. I think it was Glenn Rushton. Just liked his advice. He just looked like a guy who'd been around the game for a number of years. Just knew what he was doing. Phil Sutcliffe back at home, Rob, as well, in Dublin. I see Phil Sutcliffe, excellent fighter in his own right, taking guys and improving them. I see them in their debut. And then I see them 10 fights later and they're better fighters. That for me, Rob, is a good coach. I was actually in the dressing room with um, with Oshin, with Phil Sutcliffe one time and he's very uh, composed character. It was before the Eddie Highland fight, actually. Mm. And um, he was just telling him, you know, he was giving him instructions, but he was just being nice and calm, nice and direct with him and maintained that throughout the fight. Like So, yeah, no, Phil Sutcliffe was up there. Um, but, you know, you got to get guys like Storm and Norman back on the scene. You know, fucking oh, fight no, him, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, his fight Shut with Alt Mercerson. 
Yeah, we got we got we got into it last week. Yeah, Stormy Norman. Yeah, we need more guys like him. You know what, Rob? Um, Highland Fagan, Tala Basketball Arena. I was at that fight as well. Didn't even know you. Yeah, well, I walked those scene to the ring. Actually, shout out those scene. I was at the Wu Wu Tang Clan concert with Oshin this week uh, in Dublin for the Gods of Rap, Public Enemy, Wu Tang Clan, De La Soul, DJ Premier, the chat, all the chat's favorites. <laughs> So, yeah, shout out to Oshin. He's in good shape. He fucking ran home after drinking all night. So, uh, still looking for a fight if, any, if anyone's wanting it. Um, yeah. Great guy, Oshin Fagan. I can second that as well. One of boxing's good guys. Let's move on to Belly of the Week, shall we? I've had a few come in while I've been on the air. I'll read them out in a bit. But the ones I've got written down, including a few that might have crept in from last week when I wasn't here. Thank you to Hater Dave as well for doing such a fantastic job jumping in. He's that knackered. He couldn't come on this week. We have got Smido, we have got Rob, and we have got Andy. Let's finish up then with Belly of the Weeks. Uh, Jake Winterbottom sent one in for me. It was uh, talking about Jordan Gill, who lost last weekend. I haven't seen the fight because I was away. Uh, Jordan Gill got what he deserved for vacating his Commonwealth belt and trying to leapfrog levels by picking up a Mickey Mouse WBA belt for a ranking, says Jake. Also, Belly of the Week for Eddie Hearn, shamelessly saying on Sky, that Lee Wood is a star and can win a world title. You might agree with that, Smido. You're a, you're a big fan of Lee Wood, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. We, I'm looking to get him on, actually. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, it was great for him to get an opportunity last week. He's been waiting around for that. I mean, it was funny how it was called a next-gen show. I mean, Lee Wood was in the year above me at school, man. Um, but, yeah, I thought it was yeah, great for him to get an opportunity. And yeah, he has got the potential to build a, a bit of a base in Nottingham. He's got the Forest lads behind him. I know it's a story we've heard before with many other fighters connected to football clubs. But um, but that's a genuine connection with the club and the fans. Um, yeah, good luck to him. I mean, it's, he's got um, a, he's, he's obviously got a very, very long way to go, a very competitive weight, particularly on the British shores. Um, and, yeah, I think that, um, I was a sceptic when he moved up weight. Um, he got beat by... Um, Gav McDonald at Super Bantam, I was there that night in Hull. Um, I didn't think he was big enough or had enough power to move up to featherweight. He's categorically proved me wrong um, and it was an excellent finish to last week's fight. Could have been Smid there. Uh, next gen, MB says in the chat, belly of the week to Harley Ben. We haven't mentioned him. He's been on the party, spoke well, he's a nice guy, but he was advertising an after party on Twitter. And then, of course, <laughs> he got knocked out or he got uh, outpointed, rather, by a Norton 16 guy. There's a long way to go for old Harley. Like I say, he was a nice chap, but don't think he's going to end up uh, anywhere, to be honest, no. Uh, Joel for a week. Go and follow him on Twitter. He's good value, at Joel for a week. He was tweeting under an Inoue picture. Inoue said he had arrived in Scotland and all that. And Joel put in Japanese below a nice message, which translated as, you will all be raped by Godzilla while Inoue is in Scotland. Quite a few people, I think, were, were liking that as well. So Joel for a week on Twitter. <laughs> go, go and enjoy it before he gets banned, Rob. <laughs> Quite the character indeed. Uh, Belly of the Week nomination here from Jake Winterbottom again, throwing them in over on Facebook. Curtis Woodhouse tweeted out a picture of him with his son when he was uh, back in the day, a lot younger, obviously 15, 16 years ago. And then Woodhouse said, uh, tweeted out, I left school with one GCSE and I think I managed to do OK. My son Kyle has shit for brains like me and has his GCSEs this week. Just do your best, son. A piece of paper does not define you or your life moving forward. Me and your mom are proud of the young man you are becoming. <laughs> Jake Winterbottom says, value of the week for dad of the year, Curtis Woodhouse. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got shit for brains like me, son. <laughs> Good you know, for the stars. <laughs> well, you know, if he can play football like his old man, he'd make a few quid and then move over to boxing as well. Fair play to old Curtis. Saw him took his first loss, actually, back in uh, a fight that Alex Steedman mentioned at the weekend, 2009. Martin Lindsay, Paul Appleby undercard was the first time Curtis Woodhouse lost. I think it was against Jay... <sighs> Jay, somebody, you know what, it doesn't matter, does it? Let's move on. Uh, Spencer Oliver has been nominated here by somebody. Anyway, they were talking about who wins, a peak Mike Tyson or a gorilla on the Pound for Pound podcast. Sounds like they're getting as bad as us over there. So Spencer Oliver's been nominated for that anyway. Did anybody see this? Andy may be over in Australia. Cocaine Dawkins said, this is what we're treated to on pay-per-view in yeah, Australia. Yeah, every cunt. Was it uh, Troy McMahon or something? 26 seconds. <laughs> I only seen oh the, I only seen the 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 gaffe, I think it was. Um, I do, is, he, is he on some sort of ex fucking football player or something? <laughs> he's, rugby the, player. He, he's like, don't hit me. He's like, 
he got a tag with his heart. He was like, oh, shit, don't, don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Gets iced in the next... Oh, man, it was fucking abysmal. It's been it's been uh, billed as an absolute joke fight. It was uh, Justin Hodges against Troy McMahon. If, if you have a look at it on YouTube, it's a black eye for boxing. It says on the Daily Mail. It was truly horrific. This guy was terrible. Another one, Andy, who makes me think. You never know. Could dust off the gloves. I might have a bit of a, a future in the sport yet. Andy agrees. Let's get back in there. Sorry. If, uh, oh, no, I'm... just if that guy is the standard, Andy, I could maybe dust off the gloves. Uh, hi. True, mate, true. <laughs> maybe not. I could maybe get left in a state. Anyway, let's move on to Martin Hurry. He's uh, who's he nominating? Let's have a look. Bob Arum. Uh, Schwartz would be a favourite over Ruiz, says Bob Arum. Bob Arum hits back over Eddie Hearn's comments about the Fury versus Schwartz fight, insisting Schwartz would be a three or four to one favourite against Anthony Joshua's opponent, Andy Ruiz. So a nomination there for Bob Arum. Oh dear, what else have we got then? Just flicking through them now. Box Royalty has nominated Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. It's coming, he says, and he was doing some interesting training out on the grass. He's coming back, everybody. Team Chavez Jr. is the hashtag if you want to get on top of it. Richard Lodder has nominated Stephen the Breadman Edwards. If Canelo fights Andrade, says Breadman, in his next fight, he may go from Hall of Fame to all-time great status. You have to give credit for taking killer fights, win or lose. That's a terrible style matchup for him. It could be an Ali versus Norton type of thing. So I'm nominating for Edwards there. Cocaine Dawkins again has nominated Dave Allen. No Aussie on this week to get stuck in on this one. Allen was saying how bad, what was it, the Brazil? I haven't got the, the, the screenshot here. I think it might have been how bad Brazil was or how bad uh, Billy Joe Saunders' opponent was. It was something like that anyway. And Cocaine Dawkins was saying pop kettleback situation here. Uh, John Evans has nominated Adam Catchell. Yes. I'm, block I'm blocked for this one, Andy. But he was disputing 115-111 about being a 7-5. Liam got jumped in on this one as well. Who is this Catchell individual? Is he from Talk Sport, wasn't he? Yes, he is. Um, remember, they won the podcast awards. for the. the, the... Oh, he's from... Um, Talk Sport. Oh. Uh, fight retards or what do you call them again um... <laughs> well, I forget the name of it yeah. but anyway no, basically what he said was um, I think John Evans put up his, put his, um, his scorecard as 7-5 which was 115-111 with the two knockdowns and stuff and uh, Adam Cattrall being like the font of all box knowledge that he is you know he is a award winning podcaster you know and he basically says 115-111 isn't 7-5 ok Adam Shut your mouth. According to the chat, Sandy, it's Fight Disciples. Fight Disciples, that's who it is. There you go, Fight Disciples. Can't say I've ever listened. Maybe I will from now on, you never know. Well done, Mr Catchall, you've been nominated anyway. A few people threw Casual. that in. Could Casuals. be a front runner. Could be a front runner. Uh, David Torrens has nominated George Banjo. He uh, George Banjo Instagrammed or tweeted, I think it was, to Anthony Fowler. Shout out to my guy, Anthony Fowler. Put me on the CBD oil. Genuinely thought it was all hype. But my knees haven't been this pain free <laughs> in a long time. Thank you, bro. And a little fist. So there you go, Anthony. Anthony Fowler helping people out with the CBD oil there. Um, Simon says, where was nominated Gav the Hat? You'd finish Walder in three rounds, mate. He's talking to Dave Allen, naturally. Uh, Dominic Henry has nominated Gary Russell Jr. and his post-fight T-shirt last night. Casual moment. Didn't see it. Anybody see Gary Russell Jr.'s post-fight T-shirt? Know what it, what was written on it? I did actually text uh, Dominic earlier, so let's just go live on air into my WhatsApp here. Hope Is it 3.30 no new... in the morning? No, I didn't Maybe see that one. It said, uh, Leo, ne Le Leo next, what's up, Al? Had it emblazoned on the back of it. Leo next, what's up, Al? So there you go. Uh, a message from Russell Jr. He wants to fight Santa Cruz next, Andy. Santa Cruz. Oh, by the way, just threw us wee fact in here, by the way. I just found the the the, um, the minutes that Inouye's fought in his last three fights. McDonnell, one minute and 52 seconds. Piano, 70 seconds. And Rodriguez, five minutes. <laughs> Ooh! Is me? Rodriguez was like overtime for him? Aye. He must have got pissed off for that, eh? <laughs> About to blow out. Uh, Toby Hines, please nominate Ben Davison for Bell of the Week. Two IFL interviews in the last two weeks. Last week, he says Wilder avoided the Fury rematch. This week, he says Billy is avoided by Andrade. Both his guys, said Toby, pulled out of mandated shots. Is he so stupid that he cannot even get uh, make up a lie that does not fall apart at the first poke? <laughs> so nomination for Ben Davison. Good call. Good, uh, good snatch there from uh, Toby Hines. 
over on facebook.com forward slash boxing asylum. Declan Graffin, nomination for creepy Adam Smith, not Smido, for calling Jamal Charlo Jamel numerous times while interviewing him. Whew. There we go. Oh, stop the pod. Oh, a Ty and Booth video has dropped apparently, guys, live while we're on air here. The, the chat is saying, oh, yes. breaking news, Ty and Booth, that'll do. That'll do nicely, Rob. Actually, I had an idea, right? End the podcast now, Rob. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but He's doing it on purpose to try and take our thunder. We're the number one <laughs> Sunday night destination. They think Ty and Booth is raw, right? You should come on the chat with us when we go off air. So if you want to pay, pay Patreon dollars to us, We'll let you come on off air when the real shit goes down. You think this podcast is good? You want to hear us off air? It's fucking unbelievable. Uh, so, yeah. Five dollars yeah. in the Patreon, baby. We could sort of the world famine problem by being poverty and distress. Oh, we get it all covered. You, you bet you the Middle East crisis, we have it all unlocked. Me and Rob talk about Brexit. Yeah. All angles, whatever you want. Popular culture, you bet you name it. So, pay us dollars and you can come join in on the crack. Rob's all already said when he, when he becomes Prime Minister that Smith was going to become his phone secretary. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to meet... Hey, I can't have a job with foreign middle. in the name title. <laughs> 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 what are you going to say, Rob? <laughs> no, the thing about politicians is they're all liars anyway, you know what I mean? So the left and the right, you know what I mean? So we're all fucked if, if uh, any of us And the centre, and the centres. <laughs> and the centre, but we, I, think, I think we'd turn into some kind of evil dictatorship if we got power, so I'm all for it. What Rob's saying there, everybody, patreon.com forward slash boxing asylum. That's the way to go, everybody. That is the way to go. CR Boxing has been nominated for Bellew of the Week uh, live tonight. Here's our top 10 heavyweights at the moment, he said. Joshua at one, Fury at two, White at three, Usyk has not even fought a heavyweight at four, Wilder at five, Ortiz at six, Povetkin at seven, Pulev at eight, uh, Parker at nine, and Dave Allen at ten. What's everybody else is says CR Boxing. He's been nominated by MC underscore Jarrett, 13 for that one. Also, a few more coming in. I'm reading them live on the air here, so... I might make a balls up of them. Uh, Zeconomics has nominated Anthony Joshua. Links find your magic, it said. The Anthony Joshua links range is now available. Looks like it's an Aldi there next to uh, some boxes of Capri Sun. So it, he's doing well. Deodorant-wise is Mr. <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> also, Dobbs, Dobson Box Bet has nominated Dominic Brazil for telling BoxingScene.com. I think the referee stopped it a little early. Jim Gray apparently has been getting a bit of heat. Did he slag off? Dominic Brazil after the fight basically said he's a big lump of shit or something along those lines. Maybe in the chat, if anybody heard that, you can let me know. He doesn't mess about, doesn't he, Jim Gray? He's always speaking the truth. Yeah. Jim Gray, um, Jim Gray went over to talk to him and he ref- and Virgil and Brazil both told him to naff off. He refused to speak to him, so they spoke to Ortiz instead. Can I just say, without um, going not too far off, I'd, I'm not interested in Wilder versus Ortiz rematch. Ortiz has, has not got it in him anymore. He's already proved that once. He had Wilder ready to run, ready to go and, and couldn't follow through. He ain't going to do it again. If, Smido, we can't have the big guys fighting each other next and we're going we're gonna to get another round robin of shit, would you then accept Wilder against Ortiz? I would prefer Wilder against White, which is outside of the, the top three big boys. But well, I'd, I'd like to see uh, Wilder against uh, Tom Swartz. God, no, thanks. I'll tell you what, Schmid- Smido, one thing that's come to my mind as well, and I'd like to ask you about this. We're going off topic here for Bellew of the Week, so I we might as well throw it in before you disappear. You see the weight discrepancies at heavyweight. You know the way whenever somebody in the lower weights blows up 10 pounds, 12, 15 pounds, and we say, oh, it's dangerous. What about the heavyweights? Wilder's coming in the low 200s. You've got big fat lumps like Brazil, even Fury, outweighing him by multiple tens of pounds. Is there any issue there? Do we turn a blind eye? Is it because it's heavyweights and it doesn't matter? What do you think, Smith? Probably because it's heavyweight, but it's all relative, isn't it? I mean, five pound at bantam weight is a lot more than you know percentage wise than probably fifteen or twenty five pound at heavyweight. So it is all relative, but it's just the part part of the game, isn't it? I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to start getting get, putting a giant weight in there and stuff? Probably not. Shut up, Welling, says Smido. Completely on board with that, sir. Any other nominations for Bellew of the Week? I'm liking the Ben Davison one from Toby Hines, personally. Anybody else want to throw anything? Wasn't there one from yeah. Wilder where he said um, it's 90% mental and 4% physical or something? <laughs> that what, surely you've seen that, surely. You've and some, that. someone tweeted, uh, what a dickhead, what about the other 3%? <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, uh, one for, for Brazil because he deleted his Instagram account today, so he's obviously ooh. taking it very hard. 
Um, and one for me missus because I was trying to get out on time and she was telling me all about her hopes and dreams and I was like baby I have hopes and dreams too I have to go out and talk to these 20,000 listeners and she said 20,000 listeners and I said yeah she was like well I'm not one of them <laughs> so soon oh, you get a better of the week for that Mrs soon Kelly Mrs out. Kelly dropping a left right on you tonight yeah yeah iced ice ice baby indeed uh, Jason Chukwu Smido uh, has said some disparaging things about you in the chat. I was going to give him a shout out, but I'm quite offended by these comments on your behalf. We can do that these days, Smidder, be offended on somebody else's behalf. Steve, there's not many contributors verbally or to this podcast than me, but Jason Chukwu is one of the very few that is worse than me on this podcast. <laughs> there you go, Chukwu. <laughs> Another so cool. icing. Chukwu lying on the canvas like Dominic Brazil. Uh, any other nominations, Andy, from you? Nothing for me, mate, no. Nothing from Andy. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So Wilder is right up there. Dominic Brazil is up there as well. Adam oh, sorry, Cattrall, Steve. Front runner. Yes, yes. I had, to, I had to nominate myself for breaking Ooh. the sanctimony of the dressing room by uh, quoting Donny Baseball's <laughs> tweet about Margaret Thatcher's uh, <laughs> being a loser. What stays in the chat? What goes in the chat yeah. stays in the chat, Rob. But I thought that was such a unique quote to compare her to. To compare Wilder's power to the IRA's trade against Margaret Thatcher. It's like the greatest co- pod contribution from oh, Donny in the recent hell. weeks, I think. <laughs> yeah, you, you said it. Uh, yeah, so between Adam Catchell and Ben Davison for me, Andy, who are you going for this week? Uh, Adam Catchell. Adam Catchell, indeed. Maybe another wa- award could be coming his way. What about Stephen the Breadman Edwards as well? Or maybe uh, our friend Mr McMahon over in Australia, Rob, he could be going. I tell you what, the Aussies, they, they have it rough with boxing, don't they? We moan about pay-per-view over here. Everything's pay-per-view over there. Uh, t- that, that Tim Zub is like 60 fucking dollars or some shit, man. No oh, what, way, what? was it? <laughs> Jeff, Horn- Jeff Hornham and uh, Mundine. Mundine. That was big money. That was a big money draw down under. Anyway, yeah, um, Rob, who are you going for? Yeah, shit. Uh, I don't know. I'll come back to you. Who knows? Who knows, indeed. Smido, maybe you know Adam Catchell for me. Adam Catchell for Andy as well. Who are you going for, Smid? I'm going for the kid that had Dave Allen number 10 heavyweight. Oh, that was. Um, let me see. Let me see, indeed. He, they followed me straight after I liked their tweet, so I'm on board with this uh, crowd now. At CR Boxing, Smido. At CR Boxing. There you go. Nomination from Smid. What do you reckon then, Rob? Come on. Sorry, I was uh, walking down the field there and I stumbled across what appears to be a young couple in love. So Ooh. I was just making a detour. <laughs> mate, <laughs> uh, mate go, go back and take a video of it and put it on the chat here. Yeah, they think it's a dog and party or something if I walk up. I have the, I have the dog with me and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for Catchell this week, man. <laughs> the dog getting get involved there, Rob? Who knows? <laughs> Trainer of the year. <laughs> On a side note, actually, I was listening to a podcast this week, non-boxing related, but this is the week that Jeremy Coyle uh, over in the UK has been suspended for whatever reason, and there was a fella who was telling a story. That, that he was on he was on the J- Jeremy Coyle show once, Andy, and he was in the audience. And apparently, as part of the story, some young lady had been having uh, relations with a dog in the living room, and the, the child had seen this. And there was a video, and they played the video and everything. And when and, it, and the guy who was watching it was thinking, "Oh, this is going to be great when it comes on ITV." And lo and behold, it got onto ITV, and they never even mentioned that storyline about the dog whatsoever. It's completely blanked out. So Jeremy Coyle in in fake. Shocker there, Andy. Uh, it's a fake, actually, because it's a pity he got taken off air because Johnny Nelson could have walked on there and explained the day that he killed. He's talking I'd watch it. I'd watch it. Do it now. Johnny Bond, <laughs> he's just not trying to explain. I couldn't look at my dog anymore because he was being buggered off as fucking tradesman. Oh, I would love to find that story, Andy. That must have, that's going back a few episodes if you want to know what I'm oh, talking what? about. Oh, that's true, mate. If you, if you didn't know what I'm talking about, go and read Johnny Nelson's book about his dog. It's fucking Jesus Christ. <laughs> Right, let's get out of here. So, uh, between me and you, Andy, we have managed to uh, nominate Adam Catchell. So, he's winning awards for Fight Disciples and he's winning awards on this show as well. Another podcasting award. He is the Bell of the Week. So, congratulations to you, Mr. Cat- Mr. Catchell. Maybe you can learn how to score. 
in future, if you want to continue following the boxing game, like all these guys are anyway, Adam Smido Smith, thank you for joining us. Great to hear from you. Rapping Rob Kelly as well. Good man, as always. And Andy Patterson. Thanks to our two guests as well, right at the top of the show. We had Leon Woodstock and Zelfa Barrett. They're going toe-to-toe on June the 15th. May the best man win. I've been Steve Wellings. Thank you to everybody in the chat. We'll speak to you all again, same time, same place next week. Bye.